Hello all, this is the Owl, and as some of you correctly guessed, here it is. Yeah, a bit of a change of plans, but so be it. In order to not have a release schedule of one video a month, yes, we won't be doing that again in a hurry, I generally try to break longer manga up into volumes or arcs. However, this can make it all a bit clunky to follow. So what we'll be doing today, and if it works out more in the future, is something of an experiment. And yes, like any good experiment, occasionally this means something will go boom and embed glass shards into a nearby wall. More about this in a second. Anyway, here's the first arc of Maiden Abyss, meaning volume 1 through volume 5, combined into one super long video, so all of you who like to draw, fall asleep, or otherwise game to my content can enjoy. And to encourage folks to keep watching, I've reworked a few effects here and there, made some minor corrections and changes, and also excised irrelevant details. However, please keep three things in mind. Firstly, these were made over eight months, on several different microphones, in a variety of conditions, weather and otherwise. I have done my level best to balance the audio, but if it sounds a bit inconsistent, well, that's why. Secondly, due to my own dumb attitude, I lost the file for volume 4, meaning that I've had to import the video directly and edit that. So if the visuals are a bit wobbly for that part, and some cuts seem a bit abrupt, this is why. Finally, since this video will be ass-numbingly long, let's quickly do the pluggity plug stuff, because I suspect not everyone is going to make it to the end here. So, before we start, as always, a big thanks to my patrons and all the other folks who help with these, as well as a special thanks to the lovely Mrs. Owl. If you enjoyed this video, why not jump on the Discord and thank her directly, because without her wrangling baby owl, very few of these would have been done. If you want to help us out and ensure that I can keep on doing this into next year, why not become a patron yourself? I won't lie, we're a bit touch and go financially right now as to what happens with this channel next year, so it would help. You will also gain access to early videos, Discord perks, and even some completely unique patron-only videos, the first of which is already up. Otherwise, come check out the Discord, some of the absolute greatest and most wholesome people you were ever going to meet. And with that, let's kick off our first full story analysis of Maiden Abyss. Made in Abyss is one of those manga... mangas? Manga, with a truly fascinating origin story that is almost as interesting to talk about in terms of its origins as it is to read. It's not quite bleach levels of, wait, that couldn't possibly have happened, 
But it is definitely still one hell of a tale. Akihito Tsukushi, who had previously done design work for somewhat obscure JRPGs, decided to put pen to paper and try and get a creative work published. And oh boy, did this start a journey. Initially, Made in Abyss wasn't even intended to be a proper mainstream manga. Tsukushi envisioned it as a dojinshi, a shorter, less formal, generally self-published comic, often sold at conventions. He actually wanted it to be a pop-up picture book, which, you know what? I'm so curious to know what that would have looked like. I'm not sure what happened next, but somehow Made in Abyss was picked up by Take Shobo, published as a webcomic, and it flopped. Yep, Made in Abyss was not a hit on release. Far from it, actually. Criticized for its exposition and plodding pace, as well as its boring side characters, our story could easily have ended in the manner of so many other attempted manga epics, cancelled after only a few chapters. Fortunately, instead of giving him the boot, Tsukushi's publishers offered him some advice, and following it, he reworked the manga adding in fan-favorite Nanachi as a new character, and adopting a substantially darker tone, which not only saved the manga, but made it into kind of a sleeper hit, particularly due to the anime adaptation, which honestly came out really well, with great art, great pacing, one of the best soundtracks of all time, and the excision of a lot of the more, how would I put this, contentious content from the manga. <coughs> oh shut up, nobody wants to talk about you. I will say that I like the first season more than the second, but both are an absolutely great way to experience this astonishingly good and mind-blowingly dark manga, especially if you factor in, <coughs> nope. Not a chance. It also got a video game adaptation that I recently ended my extended series on, and as far as adaptations go, well, it's not Arkham Asylum, but I actually had a pretty damn good time with it. <coughs> ah, okay, whatever, let's get this out of the way. Much as we did last time. The gigantic elephant in the middle of a rather small room, mostly filled with other smaller elephants. To say that Made in Abyss is a touch controversial is like saying that the Dead by Daylight community can be a bit spicy, or that my shoes are somewhat inedible. The only manga I can think of offhand that gets people at each other's throats like Maiden Abyss does is probably Terraformars. Oh boy, am I looking forward to the comments section when I do that one, chaps. And, uh, what do I mean? Well, let's see. How do I put this in a way that isn't going to make the YouTube content bots fill their socks with poo? Well, Made in Abyss features characters that are, at the very least, drawn really rather young. And, not to mince words, there is also a lot of nudity. Fortunately, nothing more than nudity, unless you count soul-crushing violence, but for what there is, it's pretty damn egregious. Now, after being pressured, Tsukushi has remarked on this saying that it was not intended to be done in any sort of icky or titillating manner, and it's more to emphasize how human and how vulnerable these characters are in an astonishingly hostile environment. And, okay, that is almost reasonable. However, there are still a handful of panels that have a very fan service honestly even pin-up quality to them. They are more than a little bit gross. On top of this, 
Tsukushi himself definitely has some weird kinks and maintains an almost conscientiously bizarre presence on social media. So who knows? With the benefit of a year thinking about and talking to other people about the whole thing, I don't think anyone would put it past Tsukushi to have deliberately stirred up some controversy to get eyes on his manga. So. Is it all a weird publicity stunt to get people talking? Is it Tsukushi being a massive degenerate? Or is this an entirely innocent artistic choice to enhance the anxiety porn that is this story? Well, as I've said before, you are all big boys and girls, so this is one that you will need to decide for yourselves, whether this is a deal breaker or not, and in what spirit this was all intended. Just before you go and buy this thing, please be aware of what is in there. I will naturally be showing nothing of this, and I will also be censoring liberally when it comes to this video series. But again, if this sort of thing bothers you, go and watch the anime. It is perfectly fine. There are also a good few other juicy controversies involving this manga, but we will run screaming over those bridges when we come to them. And with that, as this is already going to be a really long video, it's time to dive. Our story opens in Orth, a large steampunkish settlement built on the perimeter of Uncle Cthulhu's happy fun time murder hole, aka the Abyss, a seemingly bottomless chasm stretching down forever, so big that it is, in essence, almost an entire planet unto itself, containing multiple varied and alien biomes, unique flora and fauna, and other dangers. This is our setting for the time being, and as the story progresses, we will learn a lot more. The first thing to take note of here is the art, which, frankly, might be some of the best I have ever seen in any manga. At first, it looks almost hand-drawn, and vaguely sketchy, in a way that reminds me of Eddie Campbell's work on From Hell, or maybe Hiroaki Samura's gobsmacking art in Blade of the Immortal. But... Mrs. Owl informs me that the entire storybook effect, including the texture on the paper, I don't know if you can make it out here, or if maybe the YouTube compression might have killed it, but regardless, apparently it's all done digitally. Which, eh, yeah, I won't lie, it's a bit of a pisser, but I still love it. The visuals add so much to the dark fairy tale atmosphere of the story, and this only gets more and more impressive as the manga goes on. You'll see what I mean. On the other hand, Tsukushi releases chapters in an almost Miura-ish fashion. So yeah, there will always be trade-offs to this kind of auteur mangaka. Regardless, this isn't your standard shonen jump manga. There are very few empty panels. You know, where two characters sit and talk against a white background. Here, the sheer richness of, well, everything is nothing short of amazing. This is the sort of manga that you could read a dozen times and will still be noticing tiny background details, all of which add texture to the world or even foreshadowing. Anyways, we soon meet our kind of protagonist, Riko, a young girl of reasonably, almost deliberately indeterminate age. <coughs> nope, 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 nope. She has an artifact that she refers to as the Star Compass, 
And, spoiler, this thing is probably going to turn out to be pretty significant plot-wise, but as of yet, nothing has been explained. Regardless, it works like a compass, but seems to point down towards something in the depths of the abyss. And yeah, as I said, the art in this manga is just something else, man. Look at this. Just look at this opening spread. Look at those gorgeous pastel colours. Those almost edible blues and pinks. And how the perspective draws your eye first to Recall, then down to Orth, and then further down into the abyss, starting us out with a happy impression that slowly but surely gets more and more ominous. Gravies and gentlemen, this is how you open a manga. Riko has a few friends, Nat, Shiggy, and baby Kiyui, as well as one or two adults, and we actually spend a fair amount of time with them over the next volume. Wouldn't it be strange if all of them turned out to be absolutely pointless to the plot? Yeah, I explained this in the intro. We then get some more bonkers amazing art, and we learn about the Abyss and Orth. As mentioned previously, the city sprang up around the edges of the Abyss due to the amount of folks drawn to it in search of the powerful and valuable relics found within, meaning that Orth is part archaeological site and part trade hub. We learn that the Abyss itself also has a, <laughs> yeah, let's not beat about the bush here, a plot convenience force field that prevents observation or aircraft traversal from above, or perhaps more importantly, people annoying Tsukushi on Twitter with questions about this. Answer, there's a force field. A bit contrived, but I won't poke it too hard. For the next while, we follow Riko in her day-to-day -day life. She's friends with Laffy and Hubble, the former being a motherly shopkeep, who you might recall from the game, and Hubble, a Black Whistle tier raider, which marks him as a veteran. As we'll learn soon, cave raiders carry a whistle, used to alert other cavers to their position in case of danger or often distress and they are ranked according to the colours of said whistles. Red whistles are the novice raiders, permitted only in the topmost and least dangerous layer. Blue whistles are experienced raiders, permitted to venture down further. Moon whistles are instructors, black whistles are the veterans, and above even them the legendary White Whistles, who we'll get to eventually. For now though, we're just getting to know Riko, and while she can be at times a really frustrating protagonist, she is at least a fairly fleshed out and consistent character. She's irrepressible, but occasionally irresponsible, trusting to the point of being naive, and reasonably competent, but overambitious and constantly overestimating her own abilities. And yes, this is a perfect and almost deliberate recipe for utter catastrophe. Sure enough, we next see her and her friends in class, being lectured by Judo and the director of the orphanage. And yes, I am going to call it that. This is the first time we hear mention of the so-called strains of ascending. Basically, the abyss functions a bit like a pitcher plant, or maybe the ocean. You can go down as far as you want, but coming back up incurs severe physical symptoms. As with many things, we will get to know more about this very soon. Oh, and we also learn that the orphanage are kind of a bag of hooting dickholes, using young orphans, orphans? No, I'll stop. 
to explore the upper levels of the abyss and gather relics, which are then taken by the orphanage to sell. Which is honestly pretty diabolical. And is it just me, or does the director look way too much like the wicked stepmother? It's probably deliberate, once again, due to the whole dark fairy tale tone here. But maybe you can already tell why this manga did not do so well initially. And if you can't hear, you'll definitely click when you get around to reading it yourself, because I have cut a lot. The start of the story is paced like molasses, and it consists of mostly world building and exposition. Far more tell than show. It's like that first time DM who emails you a hundred and forty pages of backstory to read before her campaign starts. That all said, it's not dreadful. The world is deep and impressively textured. The characters are all well fleshed out, and there are occasional flashes of foreshadowing that, on rereading, are a lot smarter than I thought on my first time through. Just take this sequence, for example. We see that Riko is unhappy with her mission to gather relics on the first layer. Her ambition is to become a white whistle, of all things, so she attempts to catch a deeper dive off Jidor. However, when he asks her why she cave raids and wants to push so fast, she reveals that it's partially because she wants to become a white whistle, partially because she wants to go down and find her mum, and partially because, well, the abyss is there, and because it's there means that it must be conquered. If you're an old fart like myself, this might remind you of a famous George Mallory quote, and if so, I don't think you're wrong. I actually spoke about this at length in my Nature of the Netherworld series, but there's a fascinating parallel and resonance between the story ahead and certain real-life stories of doomed, lost expeditions. Regardless, Jiruo refuses, but does compromise saying that if Riko can distinguish herself in the upcoming raid, he may consider this in the future. Inspired, Riko prepares for her delve, and then the next morning heads off alongside the other Red Whistles as her friends and the other inhabitants of Orth cheer them along. Little does anyone realize that today's delve will kick off a chain of events leading to pure, shattering horror. What do I mean? Uh, okay. So, there is a genre of manga that has gradually become popularized over the past decade or so. After a fair amount of reading around and chatting with folks, does not seem to have any official term attached to it, which sadly makes discussing it rather imprecise. Personally, I've always liked to call it horror in disguise, but probably the most commonly applied term is gap moe and I've also heard it referred to as the Gap Moe effect. In this case, referring to a manga or an anime that is deliberately set up to look cutesy-poo or even wholesome as a sort of trap, luring viewers or readers in before taking a really dark, really gory, really disturbing, or sometimes just a really melancholy turn. Often, these fall directly into the horror genre, but occasionally they're more dark fantasy, or I guess what Mrs. Owl persists in calling misery porn. 
You know, stuff like school days and bleh, happy sugar life. Speaking of anime, that shouldn't be watched by anyone. Likely the best examples would be Madoka Magica and Doki Doki, although I guess now the promised Neverland might just have eclipsed these. However, I do consider Maiden Abyss to be the true crowned paragon of this subgenre. Perhaps at least tied with another manga, we'll be doing a deep dive on at a much later date. Keep in mind that you won't be seeing much of it for a while, as Maiden Abyss takes its time, and it's not really until Volume 3 and later where we start hitting the really Lovecraftian horror stuff. But when we get there, you'll see. If you want to get to it in advance, you'll have to go and buy the manga, which I do recommend anyway. Regardless, I am a massive fan of this sort of horror in disguise story, as it tends to be something quite unique to anime and manga, and I look forward to covering more stories in this subgenre in the future. Wait, where was I? Oh right. As Rico and the others begin their delve, I just want to point out two very interesting aspects of this manga. The first is the little maps that Tsukushi often drops in between chapters, or sometimes at the end of volumes, revealing the area the characters are currently in, or have just departed from, in more detail. Again, those of you who played the game will see familiar landmarks, and as the game was created with Tsukushi's input, it actually may be worth a visit if you enjoy the manga and haven't played it yet. Just don't go in expecting much, and that's the absolute last thing I will say about the video game. No wait, of course it isn't. The second is the panelling. If you've been on this channel for a bit, you'll know that I have a deep and abiding love for creative panelling techniques, be it in Western or Japanese comics, and Tsukushi is just marvellous in this regard. Here, for instance, he goes for an almost rocky texture to enhance the feeling of exploring the caves and caverns of the first layer as Rico searches for artifacts. And yeah, keep a close eye on the panelling as we move forwards, because this gets better and better. Anyways, she does come across a so-called praying skeleton, which yeah, this is already going to be long enough, so I'm not going to go into fan theories today but these definitely tie into the larger story here in a way that we haven't really been told yet. Aside from the obvious, don't forget these, these are going to be important. After spending some time collecting relics, Rico realizes that her pack is too heavy to lift, so she tries to find Nat to help her, only when she calls out, he does not respond. Uh-oh. Rico goes off in search of him and finds, ooh, that's not good, an enormous creature called a Crimson Splitjaw, a very nasty monster from Layer 3. Don't worry, that's not Nat it's nomming on, despite the way it's drawn. Is that supposed to be clothing? I honestly don't know what's going on here. Regardless, Rico blows her whistle because she's not always the sharpest spoon in the drawer, earning her a slap which sends her flying. But before the split jaw can enjoy that big Rico flavour, something blasts a hole 
clear through it. What the hell? She investigates, finding that something punched a hole through all sorts of stuff, like some kind of flaming railgun. And eventually, she stumbles on a small shape in the grass. At first, she thinks it's just a boy, but on closer inspection, it's a... Okay, so, this story likes the term robot, but android or quite possibly cyborg may be more apropos. Back in Orth, Riko and her friends succeed in reviving said being via a torture device in Riko's room. Yes, Riko lives in an old torch chamber and no, I am not going to ask the obvious questions. We come to learn that the boy bot is extremely resilient, runs on some kind of electricity and has extendo arms as well as, oh joy, amnesia, one of my absolute favorite plot devices. <sighs> Once again, this manga's really good, so I'll put up with it. As this sequence draws to a close, we get another great little interlude, which explains to us exactly why cave raiding is such a dangerous job. As mentioned previously, the abyss works a bit like the ocean does. You can go down without too much hassle, but if you try to come back up again, bad things start to happen. Earlier called the strains, but more commonly called the curse. In short, if you ascend from layers 1 and 2, it provokes illness of varying intensity. Layer 3, hallucinations. Layer 4, extreme pain and hemorrhage. Layer 5, complete sensory deprivation, leading to madness and self-harm. Layer 6 causes you to lose your humanity by mutating and probably dying. And Layer 7, inescapable death. Yikes. And don't you worry, we'll be learning a lot about the Curse of the Abyss as we go. Oh wait, did I say don't worry? I mean the exact opposite. No reason. Soon, we rejoin the kids as they try to figure out what exactly the newcomer is. Rico has been going through the big book of weird ass relics, and there's nothing like him in there. Oh right, take note of how many of these relics are connected to time manipulation in some way. It's interesting, right? I wonder if this is going to be significant later. Again, going through this manga another time, there really are a lot of pretty nifty examples of foreshadowing tucked away in and around the margins. Regardless, despite their best efforts, the kids can't figure it out, and eventually, the boy just sort of slots into daily life at the orphanage, with Rico naming him Reg, which is, weirdly enough, the name of a dog she had. Remember this dog, because it's either going to turn out to be really important, or a gigantic plot hole. No, not that one, and I'm really curious as to which. One day, after they investigate a minor commotion near the abyss, we see that a white whistle, the actual whistle, not the person, has been found, belonging to someone called Liza, Rico's mum, as it so happens. Her full title was Liza the Annihilator, which no, that's not ominous at all, and Riko is given her whistle as a gift. Thanks to some Jiro exposition, we're told that Riko is something of an anomaly. See, Liza was sent below, all the way down to layer 4, along with, oh hey, I know who's in that big daddy armor behind you, 
I never noticed that until now, actually. Pretty neat. And their mission was to secure a stupidly powerful and dangerous relic, the Unheard Bell, which has the ability to stop time. This all prompted a brawl between their team and foreign cave raiders, and then something happened. Rico was borne down in the depths of the abyss, and shortly after this, her father died. However, thanks to a special relic known as the Curse Repelling Vessel, although I prefer the more traditional butthole box, <laughs> she was able to make it back up, albeit strangely touched by the abyss and with damage to her eyes. He leaves, and we do get the sense that this might not have been the whole story, but this does result in a curious recall sneaking into the guild headquarters to get the rest of her mother's possessions, particularly her journal, in which she finds, huh, something that looks very much like Reg. We also see a few more of her notes, including one thing to take note of, a strange snail-like creature. Keep it in mind for a good while later. Trust me, the pair also find a letter which tells them, simply, that she will be waiting at the bottom of the abyss. Oh, oh, Liza, now why would you go and say a thing like that? In the Between Chapters segment, we get a few more extracts from Liza's journal. And yes, this is wall-to-wall -wall foreshadowing here, including a large seven-tailed scorpion thing that has venom sufficiently nasty to melt through basically anything, and, oh boy, strange tortoise squirrel creatures from layer 6. <laughs> As someone who's read this manga before, I just threw up a little bit inside my own brain. We'll get there. Finally, we see the thing that Liza met, the one who looked like Reg. Apparently, he was following Liza near the entrance to Layer 7. Interesting. Regardless, the letter has a predictable effect. Rico, Reg, and the other kids concoct a truly terrible plan. Rico and Reg will sneak down into the abyss and, from there, make their way all the way down to the bottom to find Liza. What is this, Antrim? But yes, this manga is, in many ways, a pitch black fairy tale that has a certain narrative resonance with Hansel and Gretel. While the other kids attempt to dissuade her, particularly by pointing out that this is like me at eight years of age, saying that I am going to hike from Johannesburg to Zimbabwe to visit my dad, that a red whistle heading down into layer 2 is treated as a suicide, and that every layer thereafter is exponentially more dangerous, and that even if she did make it to layer 7, the curse would prevent her from ever returning home, Rico is resolute. They decide to follow a course down from the concealed wharf entrance to the abyss, through the mostly temperate layer 1, then down through the inverted forest on layer 2, making their way to the seeker camp for more information and supplies, then down into layer 3, the great vaults. Oh boy, there's some flashbacks for me. An enormous vertical flue in the earth riddled with caves and tunnels on its sides, absolutely swarming with monsters. Below that, less is known. Layer 4, the Goblet of Giants, is a watery biome filled with giant plants and even more dangerous creatures. Layer 5, the Sea of Corpses, is mostly the domain of the White Whistles, and almost nobody has ever made it down that far. 
over 12 kilometers vertically. From what is known, Layer 5 is a colossal subterranean ocean. From there, they would head down into the final two layers, of which almost nothing is known save for their names. The capital of the Unreturned and the final maelstrom. The capital of the Unreturned is so named because once you go down to layer 6, you cannot come back again due to the mutative and potentially lethal effects of the curse. The trip down to layer 6 from layer 5 is thus referred to as the last dive. And... ah, right. That's one other thing that I wanted to mention at this point. There is another term which I've encountered referring to Maiden Abyss. And no, it's not the naughty L word, which I'm not going to say on YouTube. The word is anxiety porn. And when I first came across this term, I'll admit that it put a big smile on my face, as it was both a touch of a head scratcher, but it's also just so incredibly apropos. So, what does anxiety porn mean? Well, there are a lot of different kinds of horror out there. Some horror gets right up in your face with a chainsaw and starts turning you into stakes. Some horror hides and then jumps out at you from behind a door and makes you cack your pants. Some horror oozes its way up behind you at 2am. But anxiety porn is... You know, I can't really think of many other examples in media. The girl who loved Tom Gordon, maybe? Yeah, that's about the best I can do. And, as an aside, you should really read that. It's sort of what you'd get if Stephen King did less cocaine than usual, and then wrote his nightmares after reading Made in Abyss a surprisingly similar headspace. But essentially, you've got a few genuinely likable, really innocent and well-meaning young characters placed or placing themselves in an extremely dangerous or hazardous situation, and they quickly find themselves so incredibly out of their depth that the fish have lights on. Oh, the drifting classroom. Yeah, that's another good one. Here, for instance, you've got an extremely young girl who, despite her relative inexperience, fancies herself a bit handy in terms of caving, deciding to sneak away and head down into the abyss, all while the story hypes up how mind-bogglingly dangerous the abyss is. That it's filled with horrible monsters, curses, and, well, worse things. And that she'll be basically treated as dead before too long, because she likely will be. All while the little blonde idiot smiles and pretends that it's going to be some sort of grand adventure. It's like watching a toddler playing with power tools. And yeah, I will freely admit that having just become a new father amplifies this anxiety a thousandfold. And I wish I could tell you that the anxiety gets better or that it's even slightly unjustified. But folks, we've barely even scratched the surface here. Nonetheless, Rico and Reg say farewell to their friends, including, oh right, this. Reg notices that Kiyui, the youngest of the group, hasn't been very well lately. This will come up again much, much, much later, so just remember it. Once farewells are done, and yes, this is another overlong sequence that I'm cutting down substantially here. They make their way to the wharfs in secret. Reg uses his arms to lower them down. And 
As Kiyui watches them from above, the pair slowly fade away into the darkness. And thus ends Volume 1. Oh right, before we wrap this one up for the day, I absolutely have to draw attention to the end of volume stuff that Tsukushi likes to add, as this is where some very interesting, sometimes really cool, and occasionally jaw-droppingly shocking stuff is concealed. Yes, I know that a lot of other mangaka like to do this, but it's something that I've always regarded as pretty damn neat. Right at the end of every volume, there's a page or two dedicated to unique content. Sometimes this takes the form of expansions to the existing lore of the world, elaborating on Orth, a character, creatures, some other aspect of the Abyss, or how a particular piece of technology functions at a more detailed level. It also might just happen to be a fun little recipe, or even some what-if style artwork. The latter we'll go into more as we go through this manga, as occasionally it's a pretty egregious pinup of a character with their tits out. Sometimes they're fluffy tits out. No, I'm not judging, but I'm not showing you that. But from the state of the art section on our little Discord, I suspect that this might be something some of you folks are into. While, as I mentioned earlier, the manga does contain some content that makes it a little tough to recommend, these little segues do tip the balance a little further towards Maiden Abyss being a must-buy, because I will happily admit to adoring most of them. Even the ones that kind of consist of Tsukushi being just so weird. Like this one of Nanachi where he indulges in what I can only describe as his odor fetish. Regardless, they do add something unique to this version of the story. And yes, again, we'll talk more about this as we go forward. And with that, let's call it there. We'll be taking a look at Volume 2 next time, as Rikor and Reg begin their journey down through the abyss, and we start getting a hint of what we're in for, as well as meeting a fan-favorite character. Before we dive into Volume 2, I want to draw attention to both the cover and the splash artwork that occurs in almost every volume. It's, without a doubt, some of the absolute best stuff in the manga in terms of art and visuals. I mean, look at this. Just damn. It makes me a little bit sad that the game didn't look more like this. Ah well, there's also a fair amount of artwork featuring the orphanage crew, including Nat, Shigi, and Kiyui. Even though, spoiler, they barely feature in the manga at all moving forwards. Yes, this is at least partially due to the massive shift that the manga took story-wise, as far as I know, at a certain point in Volume 2, due to its rubbish numbers. But, as you'll see much, much later, they are not completely gone from the narrative just yet, and they may end up playing a role before the end. Anyway. Volume 2 is viewed as the second of the weaker Maiden Abyss volumes, 
with Volume 3 and onwards being the better known, better regarded, more popular, and yeah, incredibly mind-alteringly dark and disturbing content that this series has become infamous for. So, in essence, consider Volume 2 a last glimpse of the light. There will come a time, rather soon, when you might just miss it. Trust me. And with that, on with the show. Volume 2 opens with Reg and Rico resting. He set up a sort of cat's cradle with his arms to detect any approaching creatures. It turns out that it's fairly effective, as Rico learns when she triggers it. Oh right, turns out that Rico likes to use Reg as a pillow. I suggest that being used as a pillow might be something else that Tsukushi is into, because this bizarrely comes up rather a lot with a few different characters. Anyway, turns out that they are nearly a kilometer down, and we get our first of many, many absolutely gorgeous landscape shots of the abyss, in this case, of the first layer, equal parts majestic, beautiful, and eerie. While, yes, I do enjoy the anime quite a bit, there is something about the way the manga captures the abyss itself that I prefer. It just feels bigger, somehow. I'm sure part of this is how the manga leaves more to the imagination, but I don't think that's all of it. Oh yeah, this. There are some pretty weird anomalies in the abyss, including the Rock Ark, an ancient sailing ship somehow embedded into the walls of the abyss. That just raises further questions! I have to wonder if this is a hint to exactly what is going on in here. I know that one theory proposed is that there are portals that bring stuff here or teleport it around. Who knows? Either way, random land ship, pretty weird. We also get the first of many, many cooking sequences, which I suspect might also be an interest of Tsukushi's. Amusingly enough, Mrs. Owl keeps threatening to make a Made in Abyss themed cooking video, which, yeah, I would actually be really curious to see her do that. Believe it or not, Mrs. Owl is an astonishingly good cook. These sequences though, they all mostly follow a theme of Rico cooks something weird, it turns out horrible looking, Rake describes it as irredeemable, but then they eat it and it turns out to be delicious. It's cute enough, I guess. Either way, they strike out on the first real leg of their journey, with Rico in good spirits, excited even, eager to venture down to the bottom of the abyss and locate her mother. It's going to be a grand adventure. Oh, Rico. We spend a fair amount of time following their journey, and oh yes, this happens. Remember it for later. It seems innocuous at first, but it may or may not be important. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Reg asks Rico about the item she refers to as the Star Compass as he can't quite puzzle it out. She attempts to show it to him, but she loses her grip and, to her horror, it falls down a waterfall, deep into the abyss. Rico's naturally upset, but she does reveal a sentiment that, yeah, again, going through this manga a second time, there's a lot more foreshadowing than I remembered, some of it being rather well done. For instance, this, to quote, 
all that is taken from the abyss will someday be returned to it, be it an object or a life. This refrain will be repeated and explored a lot more later on, especially once we get down to layer 6 and, again, as I discussed in my Nature of the Netherworld series, a lot of this story and the abyss does seem to be based on the Buddhist concept of the afterlife, particularly the various hells, as well as some Japanese beliefs about the journey departed souls must undertake after death. This, again, will become very interesting later, so you may want to keep it in mind, even if you don't go and watch that video. As they go, they also find a letter that someone has placed in their belongings. They guess that it's from Jiro, and it tells them, uh-oh, he will be on his way to capture them at dawn. Whoops, better get a wiggle on you two. Although, after reading this thing, I'm kind of rooting for him. To be honest, I don't understand why he would send that letter. Riko's theory is that this is a test, and if they can evade him and reach Lear 2 before he catches up, then he might accept that they do perhaps stand chance. But I don't know about that. A short time later, Rico stumbles into a sticky thread, provoking an attack by a voracious silk fang, a large insectile monster, somewhere between a giant spider and something that wouldn't look out of place, terrorizing Thomas Jane's son. Yeah, there's a deep cut. Honestly, the creature design in Maiden Abyss is just stellar. Some of the very best I have seen in ages, and I'll definitely speak more on this as we get further in. Regardless, these buggers aren't too dangerous as long as you leave their territory before they catch you, and thus the duo is able to escape thanks to Reg's extendo arms. They reach an outcrop, from where they can look down and see, deep below them, the second layer stretching out. And yes, before you point it out, a lot of these videos will consist of me gushing over the art because just look at it. An incredible alien landscape that still manages to be beautiful. It's like a children's book by way of H.P. Lovecraft. Damn it, do I love this manga. A short time later, we see them discussing the letter again. Reg guesses that Jiro might have put together that he's a cyborg, android, robot. You know what, fine manga, I am just going to say robot, but it does give me the mild butt pains. It's android, right? Regardless, they see something glinting off in the distance. It's a cave raider heading right for them. The pair flees, but are quickly cut off by a figure. That turns out to be Hubble, who I have to resist calling Jack Blackwhistle. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of that one. Who you might remember from earlier. We initially assume that he's been sent to capture them and return the young pair to Orth. But it turns out that Nat and Shigi found him and asked him to help Reg and Riko make it to the second layer. However, following the logic of this all being a test set by Jiro, Riko declines Hubble's help because Riko is an idiot. It's not like having a dwarven warrior on your side might come in really handy in the rather near future. No, not at all. You moron. <sighs> Hubble is surprised by her declination, but reluctantly agrees. However, he does give them a bit more information about their destination. The Seeker Camp. It's two and a half kilometers down at the very bottom of layer two, but more importantly is run by a white whistle, Orzen the Immovable. 
Yeah, she was the one in the Big Daddy armor from earlier. Liza's friend. While Rico is excited, Hubble warns them to be very, very careful around her and then, more than a little worried, watches them depart, revealing that he's always thought of Rico as a daughter. <sighs> That's just... Mate, if only you knew. Despite Hubble's misgivings, before too long, Rico and Reg succeed in making it down to the uppermost areas of Layer 2. And yeah, the environment around them is gradually becoming more and more alien. Rico, as a bona fide Abyss nerd, is overjoyed. But this does give way to unease, as they realize just how out of their depth they might be. They are now low down enough that no search and rescue party will be sent. They have not escaped anything. Indeed, they will now, in Rico's words, be pursued by all kinds of things that exist outside the territory of man. And yeah, to all of you that insist on telling me that Maiden Abyss is not Lovecraftian horror, come on! Warily, they start making their way down through a biome of what looks like colossal lily pads in the uppermost part of Layer 2 when they hear a voice calling for help. They approach it, and they find a caver being nommed on by this Lovecraftian nightmare only. They then realize that the voice calling for help is actually being produced by the creature, like it was one of those vines from the ruins. Meep. That is terrifying. We learn that the creature is called a Corpse Weeper, a vicious scavenger and predator on the second layer that, yep, comes in swarms. Reg fires out his arm trying to grab Rico, but misses. And to his horror, the Weeper flies off with her, likely to feed her to its young. In desperation, he remembers what happened with the split jaw, aims and fires a coruscating beam of vivid blue energy which, yeah, that will never not look amazing, with his Kamehameha-like attack annihilating everything in its path. Hell yeah. Take note though, despite Reg's fears, Rico is completely unharmed by the beam, although she is a little worse for wear from the Weepers. Reg catches her as she falls, and after she wakes up, she marvels at just how powerful his cannon, which she dubs the Incinerator, is. However, although it happens off-panel, Reg then blacks out. As you can see by his dreams, yeah, that's pretty damn horrifying. Regardless, having survived their first near-catastrophe, the pair strike out again, making their way deeper into Layer 2. Sometime later, we see that Rico has lost the notebook where she constantly made, well, notes in regards to what she's learned about the Abyss, and that it likely fell out while she was recreating that scene from Finding Nemo with the Corpse Weepers. She nearly starts to bubble, but yeah, you're going to have to toughen up pretty sharpish. This is something else to note about Rico's character though. She, like her mother Liza, is not only adventurous, but in some respects, a bookish, geeky sort, utterly obsessed with the abyss, its biomes, flora, fauna, and phenomena. 
Oh, and they eat the corpse sweeper, which, eh, you know, as someone who comes from a hunting and fishing family, meat from carnivores generally tastes like complete piss. Also, I wouldn't think too much about specifically what meat the Weeper has been, and by proxy what you are now consuming. Yup, Reg, that's what I was thinking. Rikor does acknowledge this in a rather Mufasa-esque manner, but yeah, no girly, you do be sorta of kinda eating people there. That is never not going to be weird and creepy. Sure enough though, now halfway down through layer 2, they enter the inverted forest, which, yeah, yet another gobsmacking double spread. Although I do wonder if the reversed waterfalls have something to do with my own theories regarding the abyss having certain gravitational and temporal anomalies. We'll explore this a bit more later, but for now, keep it in mind that there are aspects of the abyss where time is kind of broken, which could also mean that gravity is a bit strange and yeah, we still don't actually know what the curse is, so maybe it has something to do with that. Anyway, after an attack by a group of Inbior, oi, hang on a second, how come Riko and Reg get to run away, but in the game, you know what, never mind, we see that someone is watching their approach, likely from the Seeker camp, by means of a telescope. Riko and Reg head further down, and find themselves walking on very clearly man-made wooden platforms and bridges between the inverted treetops. As they close in on the Seeker Camp, somehow built into the forest and rocks above, near the bottom of Layer 2, Reg fires his arms to Batman them up, only for something inside the camp to grab them. Meet Orzen the immovable. She's <laughs> a vibe, and has a certain online following in a manner similar to Lady Dimitrescu from the Resident Evil Village game. Also known as the Battle Granny, Orzin just so happens to be the genesis of probably my all-time favorite Made in Abyss meme that doesn't involve this character. Yeah, that's wonderful. Feel free to check out the full thing in the description. Riko thanks Ozen for saving her. Remember, the thing with Liza and the curse repelling vessel? Yeah, that was Ozen. But Ozen in turn reveals that she's sort of a weird hang, saying that she was, in fact, tempted to leave baby Riko behind to die. And if she had, that kid, I think she's referring to Liza, would have returned with her instead of taking her last dive. <sighs> yeah, Orzin is, honestly, one of a few Maiden Abyss characters that I really struggle to get a handle on. It feels like sometimes Tsukushi is going for the gruff, eccentric Dagobah master character, but Orzen careens wildly between gruff bordering on nasty and abusive bordering on psychotic. You'll see what I mean. That said, she is a white whistle, otherwise known as a sovereign, and as we'll learn later, white whistles share certain characteristics. On top of being bonkers powerful, they also tend to have weird relationships with others, and are not always the nicest. <laughs> Regardless, Orzen does at least give the duo a respectful nod, saying that it is legitimately impressive that a pair of novice red whistles 
made it all the way down to the bottom of layer two and asks her ward assistant? No, I still have no idea about this character either, Murulk, to listen to them and take their story. And yes, oh joy. As I promised, we will be talking about a few of the other controversies within the Made in Abyssal sphere, and Marulk is definitely one of these. What do I mean? Okay, so... I very nearly didn't even mention this, and for the record, Mrs. Owl was emphatically against this, simply because it skirts the edges of topics and discourse that tend to be a nuclear minefield even for fully initiated young academics, let alone a thicko child of the 1980s like myself. So, disclaimer time. Before I even touch on this stuff, please keep in mind that I am a middle-aged farm boy from South Africa who spent most of his adult life in Japan. And thus, not only am I not any sort of authority on anything I am about to mention, but the acceptable language around this stuff tends to move fast, and thus it might have changed, and might be something completely different when you're listening to it, than it was when I recorded this. So please take everything I say here with a spoonful of charity and a heaping fistful of salt. Oh yeah, also, a fair bit of this information was provided retroactively by Tsukushi, in some places years after this chapter was published. So, in a nutshell, Murulk has something similar to Xeroderma pigmentosum or some other sort of intense UV sensitivity. And, not to put too fine a point on it, is canonically a boy that wears girls' clothing. And yes, you can see why this is such a fun topic. The reason why is, to be specific, where the controversy lies. Depending on who you ask, Murulk is either trance, a boy who just happens to like cross-dressing, or a boy being forced to cross-dress by Ozen for reasons. I actually spent a while looking into this and reading threads online, and all I learned conclusively was that these three groups are completely fine with the other two groups existing, and where debate and discourse exist, it's entirely respectful, constructive, and pfft. <laughs> Woo lad. And what makes it even more complicated is that cross-dressing is a very different matter in Japan, at least compared to the West. Let me further oversimplify something very nuanced and interesting. And yeah, I would obviously strongly recommend that you do your own research if you want to know more, because there are dozens of really interesting, really fascinating articles out there about this. In essence, Cross-dressing in Japan is a bit more chill and, in some respects, normalized, at least so far as recreational cross-dressing goes. For the most part, it's considered more along the lines of cosplay than a kink or an expression of identity. But yeah, I've already spent way longer on this than I anticipated. Oh, so fine. What is my theory on Murulk? Honestly, I think that this is another Nanachi situation where people might just be reading a touch too much into a thing. From my understanding, and some of this will get explained a bit later, Liza was Orzen's protege, and Orzen, heartbroken after Liza left, took on the son-vulnerable Maruk, 
but wanted to turn him into a replacement for Liza. Kind of. Hence dressing him like a girl. That's just so unhealthy. But again, I might be wrong here. Who knows? We rejoin everyone as we learn some trivia regarding the Seeker Camp and the Inverted Forest itself. That reminds me, weirdly enough, of One Piece's world building for some reason. Reg and Maruk also rapidly become friends, and no, none of the jokes I came up with here are things that you would put into a YouTube video if you wanted to monetize it. So we'll ignore them for now. We also see that the Seeker Camp is used as a sort of processing station for relics gathered from lower layers, and that an astonishingly high percentage of these are egg-shaped. Shh, not yet, my pet. Next, we get a truly bizarre sequence that does actually foreshadow something pretty evil, which, spoilers, hasn't come up again in the manga yet, but I predict that it will. Now, bear with me, because for the next bit, the manga is going to go completely off its tits. And yes, this is a taste of what is to come. That night, Rikor goes walking in search of the crapper when she nearly runs into... What the hell? The headless torso of a partially eviscerated carcass crawling around. Yeah, by the way, this is the first time where Maid and Abyss really starts to signal that it's a horror manga. Well, okay, maybe the second, third, you know what I mean. And as a fun aside, the sound effect here, Zudu Zudu, is a sort of slimy sliding and squelching noise. Japanese onomatopoeia are actually sort of wonderful very much their own thing, and I would strongly recommend reading up on these yourself. They are great fun. The next day, Orzen explains that nightmare, but first tells Riko that Liza, her mother, is in fact dead. She found her grave down on the fourth layer, and yeah, for some reason, Orzen is sometimes drawn like this, your guess is as good as mine is as to why. Orzen takes Riko to see the curse-repelling vessel, yes, that really does look like an anus, and explains that its method of operation was not exactly explained her correctly. See, it does not, in fact, protect anything from the curse. The curse repelling vessel is essentially a portable pet cemetery. If you put something dead into it, that thing will come back to life. The abomination from the previous night, Orzen apparently stuck the carcass that she had been stripping for meat in there for reasons, apparently just gets and shiggles. Oh, and yeah, recall was, in fact, a stillbirth. She was put into the relic to bring her back to life. That's just... What? Oh, and if that isn't bizarre enough for you, well... Anything put into the vessel does resurrect, but it will then inevitably make its way towards the center. Do you mean the bottom, Orzen? I'm actually not clear on that. And then eventually just die again. Thus, Rico is already dead, living on borrowed time. Which is why I said, viewing the entire abyss in light of the Japanese understanding of a soul's journey after death is pretty interesting. Orzen 
wonders aloud how long Rico has left while changing into... No, seriously, why is Ozen drawn like this? It's like something out of a Masaki Nakayama manga. That's freaky as balls. Naturally, this all traumatizes Riko, but Ozen continues until Reg steps in and intervenes directly. However, despite his bonkers strength, Ozen is utterly unperturbed. And this leads us to our first actual fight of the manga. Before we get stuck in, we do get a very brief interlude where we are introduced to the concept of the White Whistles with Hubble and some students as a framing device. More often, the White Whistles are called the Sovereigns. Liza, the Sovereign of Annihilation, with her keyhole-shaped whistle. Srajo, this Dr. De La Plaga-looking thing, with an oddly avian whistle, and Bondrude, Sovereign of Dawn, with his two hands clasped whistle, we'll learn more about these as we go. Regardless, white whistles are surrounded by mystery, intrigue, and infamy. And yeah, as you can see, they have, by a mile, the best designs in the series. Orzen, however, is famous even among this number for being seemingly ageless and stupidly impossibly strong enough to maybe qualify her for a career in print journalism or nuclear physics. I wonder what happens next. Back over. Ozen is talking some crazy shit about God while manipulating Reg seemingly without any effort. This bit is actually pretty interesting though. Ozen says that people worship the Abyss itself and that there really aren't that many other religions out there, which is okay. She then tells Reg that before he can remember anything, she must destroy him. And no, we still, at this point in publication, have no sodding idea what she was talking about. Reg goes on the offensive, but Orzen shakes him loose without even trying, even sends his own extendable limbs back at him, then slams him into and drives him through the floor as Rikor watches in horror. She dashes over, but Orzen flicks her for it, knocking her flying. Reg breaks free and rushes over to Rico, finding her bleeding heavily and almost unconscious. Yeah, don't worry you two, Orzen gave me trouble too. At least she's not throwing rocks at you. Reg, realizing their predicament, prepares to fire the incinerator at her. However, Orzen, seeing the attack coming, grabs his arm, twists it, and instead aims it at… Recall? Yeah, remember when I said that I still do not understand Orzen? This is the stuff I'm talking about because bloody hell, lady. What if this had all gone horribly wrong? Reg is able, at the last second, to change the direction of the beam, which proceeds to bore a hole in the ceiling of the camp, but doesn't harm anyone. Orzen, appearing more mildly curious than anything, doesn't take any more steps, but Reg's dander is up now, and he launches himself at her, spouting his catchphrase. He actually manages to land a pretty decent Raiden-esque hit on her, knocking aside her clothing and revealing dozens of shard-like objects embedded in her heavily scarred flesh. We learn that these are called Thousand Man Wedges, relics that confer a substantial boost in strength, and Orzen 
has essentially tricked herself out with over a hundred of these things. Sure enough, Rosen dons her armor, and when Riko comes to, sees that she has beaten the absolute stuffing out of Reg just before he passes out. When he awakens, he finds that he is being tended to by Riko and some of Ozen's fellow raiders, a bunch of ne'er-do-wells called the Subterranean Bandits. Turns out that this was a test, maybe? But again, Ozen, what if Reg's attack had gone off? Regardless, she warns them that the creatures down on the lower layers are way stronger than she is, but still offers to train them because, yeah, I guess that Orzen is going to metamorphose into that character now. Oh right, and Liza isn't dead. Apparently Orzen dug up her grave to check, there's something very wrong with you. We get a brief flashback sequence to close out the volume, showing us a bit of Liza. Once upon a time, she managed to befriend Ozen, who, by the sounds of it, became a mentor to her. We also get a very brief look at Torka, Rikord's dad, although I still have no idea why Tsukushi persists in drawing Ozen as if she was some kind of phantasm. Is this because Ozen sees herself as a monster? Does anyone know why this is? Regardless, this flashback lasts for a good long while, and mostly serves to flesh out Liza, Ozen, and Baby Rikor's relationship. We do get one really interesting bit of information. Liza adored her daughter Rikor, loved her so much that she very nearly quit exploring the abyss. And yes, I should have come up with a good brandy quote, because Liza eventually left, presumably choosing to take her last dive to prevent this outcome. She did, however, leave Orzen with the responsibility of telling Rico the truth one day, and now this is interesting, confirms that Liza wanted Orzen to direct Rico to come and find her down at the bottom. So, um, Orzen, why all the violence and pretty much attempted Rico side? Huh? Huh? Yes, yes, I know, because this is a manga thing, but whatever. With that, volume two draws to a close, and we get two outro panels one of which is a bit of fun world building, and the other one, nope, can't show you that one. And please do not go and try to find it on your own, just trust me on this. Anyways. Volume 3 starts out with our standard gorgeous double spread, and again, I wish the anime and game had looked more like this. I don't know, I've always imagined Layer 4 with that sort of amazing electric blue palette. Eh, what can you do? We also get to know a bit about relics and grades. I do want you to note the special grade relics. One of these is Reg, and the other is the Unheard Bell. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the bell is going to turn out to be really, really important later, because there's definitely something funny going on with time here, 
And yeah, we went into this a bit more in the recent theories video, and we'll go into it a little bit later too, because yeah, it really just does keep right on coming up over and over again. We also get, without a doubt, my absolute favorite Ozen panel in the entire manga. Damn it, that's just cool. And starting out from where we left off, Ozen has decided to train Riko and Reg so that our plucky duo can have a slightly higher chance than zero in the layers below where stuff exists that is even more dangerous than Orzen. In a pretty dense series of panels, she takes them to an obscure part of layer 2, allegedly less dangerous than other places, but more importantly, extremely isolated, so other raiders won't be able to interfere with their training. Very full metal alchemist and <laughs> Woo lad, that reminds me, I will eventually do a video talking about my opinions on that manga and anime, and after Bleach, that's going to be a glorious garbage fire of a comment section. Something to relish. Regardless, we do get something of a training montage, primarily from the camp's perspective, as Orzen and the bandits secretly observe Reg and Rico, evaluating their strengths, weaknesses, and overall performance. Rico is courageous, game for anything, and knows a lot about caving, but she frequently overestimates what she's capable of and is also, you know, a kid. Physically weak and pretty vulnerable. Reg, on the other hand, is tough, resilient and powerful, but is mentally weak, indecisive, and frequently a bit of a wuss. Rico acts without thinking and gets into trouble, and he hesitates when almost any action would be better than none. Oh, and this is fun. We get a brief sequence of an autobus, basically a hippo, trying to eat Reg and eventually being vanquished by the party. This was, if you remember, the final boss of the story mode in the game. Orzen and her, I think he's some kind of advisor, finally reached the obvious conclusion. The pair will need to work together, shore up each other's weaknesses if they are to survive in layer 3, and should they reach them, layers 4 and below. After 10 days, a battered and exhausted Rico and Reg return to the Seeker camp, and we get introduced to, yeah, as I said, the concept that the Abyss is filled with weird temporal anomalies. For instance, the deeper you go, the more time dilates, so just a few weeks in the deeper layers could be months on the surface. And yeah, you think you got problems. I started playing Baldur's Gate once and lost an entire month. Where was I? Oh right, Orzen also says that, and I'm guessing a bit here, even she doesn't know how extreme this effect is on the lowest layers. And that it might not have been very long at all, subjectively speaking, for Liza, if she's on layer 7. Huh. What an odd thing to say. However, Orzen also mentions something else. She warns Rico and Reg not to tarry in layer 5. Should they make it that far, the oceanic layer 5 is the boundary between the upper abyss, where you can technically return to the surface from albeit a difficult and dangerous journey, and the mysterious lower abyss, layers 6 and 7, from where no return is possible due to the power of the curse that deep. 
with the curse on layer 6, mutating you and stealing your humanity, as well as potentially killing you, and layer 7 just straight up killing you. However, she does give them one more warning. Most importantly, they should take all possible precautions to avoid running into any other white whistles. We get another nifty little panel showcasing these. Currently, wandering the abyss, Wakuna, the Chosen, who, yeah, we actually don't know much about right now at the current point in the story, but Chosen is an interesting title. Chosen by who or what exactly? Srajo we do get to spend some time with, albeit a lot later. But we're not going to touch that right now. And a certain individual known as Bondrude the Novel, Sovereign of Dawn. Oh boy. He, as it so happens, is the one worth Orzin's specific direct warning. She warns them to avoid him at all costs, as he is, in her words, an out-and-out scoundrel, and that he's not as kind as she is. Wow, that's not ominous at all. Haha, <laughs> Orzen, you're so funny. This next bit, though, I'd totally forgotten about it until I did this reread. And it is pretty damn interesting. The letter Rico found, Orzen implies that, I think, Liza might not have written it. And that's only the start of the strangeness. The glyphs it's written in are archaic, and it's written on a mysterious relic that looks like paper, but is so tough that even Orzen couldn't damage it. Yes, this will naturally come up again much, much, much later, and it does make me wonder, did Liza find this note and go in search of someone, maybe someone who knows the truth of the abyss? Huh. Before they leave Rivendell, I mean the Seeker Camp, Orzin gives them some very interesting and pretty cryptic information. And you know what, let's go through it, because again, some of this will be important soonish, and some of this stuff, while it hasn't come up yet in the manga again, it's probably going to be rather important later provided Tsukushi hasn't just forgotten about it. Firstly, in order to get down below the subterranean ocean of Layer 5, a specific relic is required, a white whistle. Okay, but Ozen, then how are these two supposed to get past it? Especially since you've warned them off the other white whistles. Are you coming with? Secondly, and more interestingly, the White Whistles who made it down to Layer 7 speak of a ring. No, not that one. Although, there really is a strong resemblance here, isn't there? <laughs> There's a fun theory for you folks. And also mentioned creatures known as gatekeepers who live along the path to the bottom. Once again, Huh. Anyways, I just thought that was neat. Moving on. Back at the Seeker Camp, Orzen gifts the duo with a... Yeah, that's honestly a really sweet design. Very Hiroya Oku. A souped-up pickaxe relic named Blaze Reap that, once upon a time, belonged to Riko's mother. Orzen does warn them, however, that it's nearing the end of its warranty period, and will thus break down soon, with, at most, 
only a few more blows left in it. Spoiler, it barely gets used anyway. Orzen also gives us a bit more of an insight into Liza's nature, saying that she's probably found a better weapon by now. Yep, I would give pretty decent odds that Liza is going to be our final baddie. I'm sure we will get there eventually. A short time later, Reg and Rico say a tearful goodbye to Orzen, Maruk, and the rest of the bandits. Orzen, standing high up, watches the two small shapes recede off into the distance and eventually fade out, musing that she wanted to keep them longer in the hopes of, I think, Reg remembering something, which I think implies that Orzen knows what's up with Liza. Um, could you give us a hint? Reg and Rico make their way to Heaven's Waterfall, the entrance to Layer 3, a gigantic flue bordered with tunnels and also the absolute worst part of the game. I'll explain why in just a moment. The pair stand at the thresholds in another just great double spread. Wow, is that amazingly eerie. And eventually make their way down, marking the point where the recall and reg portion of the game abruptly ended and the, well, the real game started. And speaking of the game, why is Layer 3 such an abomination? Well, these horrible flying rectal warts for one. Reg and Rico use small creatures from the caves along the side of the primary fluor's bait, tossing them down to distract the myriad flying monsters and using Reg's arms slowly but surely tack downwards as a blast from the past and as mentioned layer 3 is a notoriously horrible zone in the made in abyss game with a mind-bogglingly confusing layout tooth grindingly fiddly climbing evil traps bizarre combat focused arenas in a game with at absolute best okay combat systems, and, of course, Murdoka Jacks, flying monsters that will constantly zoom in and one-shot you out of nowhere when you're attempting to navigate the colossal labyrinthine biome. Yes, I still wake up some nights in a cold sweat, having dreamed that I was still stuck in sodding layer 3. Yes, yes, I know, I eventually did find a few sneaky ways in and around the zone, and as it so happens, Reg and Rico adopt a similar strategy, crawling through Neritantan tunnels, that's just fun to say, which also provides them with monster bait and food. Ugh. I imagine it tastes a bit like Kui. No! <laughs> After some time in the tunnels, they eventually pop out and see yet another ship embedded somehow in the rocky walls of the flu. However, as they emerge, they hear a familiar roar and oh bollocks, it's the split jaw that Reg blasted way back on layer one. Um, knowing what I know now about Reg's incinerator, how the hell did you survive? Reg prepares to give it another blast, and we cut over to what I can only describe as a very anime sequence, as we see Orzen and the duo training. It turns out that Reg's incinerator despite being bonkers powerful, does carry with it 
some serious limitations. After firing it, Reg will lose consciousness within 10 minutes and will not wake for two hours, during which time nothing can awaken him. Thus, when a time comes where he must use it, he will need to deal with whatever is threatening them with a single shot, as if it fails, Rico will be left undefended, and the next time he sees her, it'll be because she is being pooped out by a monster. Better yet, they are to attempt to find another solution first, with the incinerator being retained exclusively as a last resort. Back in the present, Rico uses a sun sphere, basically a flashbang, to draw the monster's attention, and Reg attacks it directly, grabbing it and using his immense strength to drive it off the cliff face. And in a sequence that I really groove, we see it tumble down into the depths of layer 3, while flying monsters swarm around it. Yeah, that's just cool. Sometime later, we see that they are now almost seven kilometers down, getting pretty close to the entrance to layer four. Sure enough, Reg looks down and we get our first proper glimpse of the bizarre watery biome of layer four. Damn it, that's awesome. And yeah, you too, be careful and remember what Orzen told you about the creatures down here. Be careful. The next time we see the pair, they are sloshing their way through the iconic warm blue water that suffuses the layer in its entirety, drawn up and expelled by the leviathan disc-shaped plants, forming the namesake goblets. Despite the heat and the danger the pair were warned of, Rico is exuberant. Reg, however, wants to find a safe place to make camp as a priority because Reg does not have a death wish. Layer 4 is indeed beautiful, but it's also really quite lethal. We also get a convenient reminder of how nasty the curse is now. Trying to ascend on layer four will, assumedly on top of the effects of the upper layers, cause you to experience excruciating agony as well as massive hemorrhage. Reg worries that Rico would not survive this and resolves to protect his companion no matter what. Oh. Reg, mate, ugh. Nope, nope, I'll be strong for now. They explore a bit further, but Reg keeps stopping, feeling a strange presence watching them. Indeed, we get a brief first-person perspective from another creature, showing us that he was correct. As they make their way, we get a few more panels showing us that they're being stalked by a bowling ball? What? Nope. It's this sinister mutant porcupine thing, which Rico immediately identifies as an orb piercer, a stupidly dangerous monster, and almost certainly one of the creatures Orzen was worried about. Now, before we go any further, I just want to give everyone here fair warning. The appearance of this creature marks, in my opinion, the specific moment where this manga changes. Remember, Made in Abyss was far from a success story when it was initially launched as a webcomic 
And it wasn't until, honestly, I think basically now, where, at the advice from his publishers, Tsukushi took the story in a somewhat different direction. Yep, we're about to get our first true taste of what makes this story so iconic and infamous, even within dark manga circles, to the extent that it's mentioned in the same breath as stuff like Higurashi. In essence, it's about to stop being fun adventure with a bit of a gritty side, and about to start being, well, made in abyss. And this won't stop for a good while. So brace yourselves, folks. You have been warned. Back over at the pair, they are cornered by the monstrosity, and Rikor gives us a brief explanation of what makes these things so uniquely nasty. From what is known of piercers, as per their namesake, their quills can punch through steel and are exceedingly lethally, yes, thank you for all the corrections in the previous video biology pedants, venomous, not poisonous, and the duo flees with the monster in hot pursuit. Reg narrowly avoids it, as it easily catches up and slashes at them, and it doesn't take long for him to realize that they're actually even more screwed than he initially thought. See, the piercer not only outpaced them, it somehow managed to predict his movements and moved in response to attack. Oh, and yeah, the paneling throughout this entire sequence is pretty damn boss. Honestly, take note of the paneling throughout this volume and moving forwards. Tsukushi really does do such a great job with it. Ditto the lettering, especially when things get squicky. Riko gives Reg her armored umbrella, saying that the piercer is pff, afraid of things bigger than itself. No, Riko, that's bears you're thinking of, not whatever the sodding assholes that thing is. And sure enough, in the span of just a few seconds, it all goes horribly horribly wrong. Instead of scaring it off, the umbrella enrages the piercer, which then wrenches the umbrella away from them and, when Reg turns, he sees that, oh, oh crap, Rikor has been impaled through the hand by one of the piercer's innumerous venomous quills. Rikor apologizes to Reg, bloody hell, as she begins to black out. Reg desperately tourniquets her arm, but realizes their predicament. She's been envenomed, and the enraged piercer, that seems to be able to react faster than he can move, has them cornered. He considers using his incinerator, but rejects that idea. If he blacks out, Rico is done for. And... Yeah, here we go. Brace yourselves, folks, because rereading this and thus knowing what's ahead, I can feel my testicles attempting to retreat up into my body. You'll see why. Reg realizes that their only move is to shoot upwards and for Rikor to suffer the curse of the fourth layer, excruciating pain and massive bleeding. She looks at him and, weakly, tells him that it's fine and to go ahead as she knows that she doesn't have much time left. Yeah, this manga man. And, reluctantly, he fires his arm up, yanking them just out of reach of the piercer. And then, the manga goes insane. 
before we do this, once again, I want you to note how Tsukushi structures this. Our first truly, well, made in abyss sequence in terms of both the lettering and the panelling, because, yeah, it perfectly accentuates the utter nightmare that is about to arrive and make this all so much worse. At first, nothing seems to happen. Then, we see Riko's perspective begin to warp, likely due to the venom. She is surprised that there isn't much pain. Then, she notices something oozing rapidly out of her hand, and realizes that the curse is beginning to affect her, starting to expel the fluids from her veins, and the venom is coming first. Only, we then see an objective shot from Reg's perspective that Oh dears, not only is Riko tripping balls, but is in a really bad way, and I wish I could tell you that this gets better. Reg, becoming desperate at his rapidly exsanguinating friend, realizes that the puncture wound left by the piercer is likely the source of the bleeding. Her other orifices are more oozing, but the hand is gushing blood, and if he does nothing, she's going to bleed out. Oh, and to make matters worse, the limb has swelled to the size of a small pig. He attempts to remove the glove, but the pain this causes Riko is unbearable. Riko, barely able to speak, turns to Reg and tells him to Oh, sweet Jiminy Christmas, no. Cut her hand off. Reg refuses, but a terrified and agonized Rico begs him to just go ahead. Yeah, as a new father, this sequence is even harder to go through now, because holy crap this manga. And sure enough, Reg prepares to perform a battlefield amputation. And if you're at all squeamish, I strongly recommend skipping ahead to the next chapter, because this is about to get, oh, just so much worse. Sorry, premiere viewers. A weeping and clearly traumatized Reg gently places Rico's arm onto a rocky outcrop, and using it for leverage, brings his strength to bear and snaps the bones in her wrist. And nope, I honestly don't think I can show you too much of this sequence. Just rest assured, my beanbag is now nestled somewhere just under my ribcage. It is utterly harrowing and easily one of the sequences in this manga that I find hardest to get through. Note that I didn't say the worst sequence. Yeah. Anyways, with the bones in her wrist pulped, Reg, using a knife, begins to hack into the mush. But before he can separate hand from arm, a swarm of flying creatures, likely attracted by the commotion and the reek of fresh blood, begins assailing them. He desperately swats at the bugs, before realizing that Riko has stopped breathing, likely having gone into shock. Now pushed beyond his limits, Reg begins to completely break down in utter horror and helplessness. However, he suddenly hears something behind him. He turns and sees this apparition looking like something Miyazaki would produce on hard drugs. It tells him that Riko's heart is still beating, but that she's on the very edge of death. And then we get a mid-volume panel explaining the adorable Neri Tantans. Nice try, Tsukushi, but oh man, I'm gonna need a minute here. Where's Baby Owl? 
dad needs some cuddles because cheesy Pete, that sequence is legit hard to read. And I wish I could tell you that it gets better from here. Hey, chaps and chapettes. Do you like the owl? Do you like Made in Abyss? Do you like video games? Want to talk about Made in Abyss while watching the owl play video games? Well, why not check out our new Twitch channel, Pluggity Plug? All links, as always, are in the description. We're currently playing the hell out of Diablo 4, nearer, 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 but we'll also be doing some Dead by Daylight towards the end of the month. We stream on Thursday evenings and Sunday afternoons. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Attendance is mandatory. Don't make me come looking for you. The strange creature tells Reg that they need to take Rico back to his, her, its. Okay, okay, I'm jumping the gun. We'll tackle that in just a moment. But I'm going with her for now, home. He follows her, and she explains that this area, for some reason, does not have the curse, meaning that they can move upwards without issue. Sure enough, they soon reach the creature's little dung ball shaped house in a secluded grove within a secret area of layer four. As they make their way in, Reg notices cave whistles on the wall. Yeah, it's probably exactly what you're thinking, maybe, but we'll get there. And removing the armor, the creature finally identifies herself as Nanachi. Yes, I said herself. Ow, 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 okay, okay. Sheesh, what was that? Half a brick? Let me explain. This fan favorite, Totoro, Koala, Cow, Rabbit, Kangaroo, a Toto Kawala Rubit, if you will, is the subject of quite possibly Made in Abyss's second most contentious controversies. As with last time, as this does concern identity, and people tend to get really prickly about this stuff, please take everything I'm about to say with a big pinch of charity and a fistful of salt. For a good while now, Particularly since the English dub of the anime, Nanachi's sex has been kept ambiguous, to the point of it becoming, well, a point of contention, at least to Western audiences. This mostly seems to grow out of her usage of specific, vaguely masculine pronouns while looking, comporting, and sounding vaguely female naturally coupled with some mild trolling by Tsukushi. After a now-deleted tweet asked him directly about the Nachi's sex, he decided to put the cat amongst the pigeons and said that he's not telling, and for everyone to just use their imaginations. This was, more than likely, just him screwing with people, because Tsukushi, but this in combination with a girlish character who uses what was perceived as a masculine set of pronouns, at least in Japanese, was taken by Western audiences to mean that Nanachi was officially non-binary, to the extent that the primary translations used gender-neutral pronouns for the character, which is entirely fine, don't get me wrong, but I do think that this all boils down to a likely cultural misunderstanding leading to the situation being misinterpreted. What do I mean? So, the pronouns, ore and 
more specifically, Oira. Thing is, okay, see, I have never encountered Oira in the wild. Ore, well, Japanese pronouns are rather complicated and do not map perfectly into English. And Ore is a perfect example of this. While it certainly does have a masculine connotation, it is also used infrequently by adventurous, tomboyish young women, both in real life and in media. I worked at an all-girls high school for many years, and their softball team, for instance, liked to use ore. I guess it sounded more assertive. Japan's actually a really interesting country, and despite its conservative nature, stuff like gender roles aren't quite as cut and dry as folks in the West seem to believe, especially amongst the younger generations. Wow, I spent more time on this than I intended. I do think that this is a case of ambiguity more so than non-binary-ness. And as I've always seen Nanachi as a female, as does, by the looks of it, most of the Japanese fandom, I will be using female pronouns for this character. However, please keep in mind that this is, at the end of the day, absolutely open to interpretation, and you are all big boys and girls. Thus, if your headcanon is of a non-binary or even a male floof monster, you are fully entitled to that interpretation. Okay? Okay. Back to the story. Nanachi explains that she's a hollow. No, not like that. A term I will continue to use here, but in Japanese, as far as I know, the term is nare hate, derived from narare or nare no hate, meaning a shadow of your former self. This will, like so many other things in this volume, make sense as we get further into the story. As a fun aside, as best as I can determine, her name essentially means that kid that says nah a lot. That's actually really endearing. Nanachi tends to recall with a surprising skill and deftness. Yet again, something to keep in mind for later. But we also learn that Nanachi isn't exactly nice. It turns out she watched them for quite some time, basically just out of curiosity, including her watching them fight the piercer. And according to her, she only helped them out of pity. However, before Reg can respond, a strange sound comes from behind him. He turns and sees that it's coming from uh, some thing that looks like a butt crack with teeth. Meet Mitty, Nanachi's companion and the subject of another of my favorite Made in Abyss memes, as well as one of the first overt nods in the manga towards Greek mythology. I've also often wondered if Mitty's appearance might be inspired by teratomas. No, please don't Google teratoma, at least not if you want to sleep tonight. Nanachi explains that Mitty is what happens if you attempt to ascend on the sixth layer. Mitty was once human, but the curse mutated her and the process also blasted most of her mind clean. Reg asks the obvious question, if Mitty is what happens when you ascend, what the bloody hell is Nanachi? She hedges for a bit, but eventually says that she is an incredibly rare exception. She does tell Reg, however, that cave raiders tend to kill hollows, 
Although I'm not sure what's up with this, as at least until I've read, I don't think it has ever come up again. Regardless, she sends Reg out to collect ingredients, allegedly for an antidote to the piercer venom. And while he's gone, she rummages through their belongings, eventually finding Liza's white whistle. And this causes her to flash back to a strange, sepulchral voice belonging to a familiar figure, the white whistle Bondroot, who Orzen went out of her way to warn the duo off of. Apparently, Nanachi aided him in the creation of ugh, cartridges. And yeah, as I mentioned, the entirety of Volume 3 should most rightly be called Pay Attention, This Stuff Will Tie Into Something Utterly Horrific Later. Yeah, those of you that haven't read this manga or watched the anime, well, firstly, go watch the anime, and secondly, remember the term cartridges. Insert evil laugh here. Nanachi treats Riko with a sort of parasitic mushroom, which filters out the venom, and Reg leaves her to recover, instead exploring the area behind Nanachi's house, finding it utterly filled with gravestones. Oh yeah, and this happens. Reg suddenly has a memory, a voice written, honestly, that looks similar to Bondrood's voice, I have no idea why, of someone saying, I'll be going now, Liza, and then Reg stumbles onto a absolutely colossal burial mount, capped off with blaze reap. Huh? To make things more confusing, he then looks at his hand and sees, is that a star compass? Where? Only when he looks again, both the compass and the burial mound are gone. And no, I have no sodding idea what went on there. Why don't you all try and explain this one in the comments? Reg puzzles over this. Orzin said that nobody was buried in Liza's grave. Why was there a burial mound? And what was that voice and the memory? However, his musings are interrupted when he sees Mitty, I guess, snuggling up to Riko, which, ugh. Reg asks Nanachi for her story, and while she's a touch reluctant, she eventually agrees to tell him. But first, Reg, who by now has realized that Nanachi can actually see the curse in the air, assumably because this is how she found this place, asks her if she can explain that. She agrees with the implication that she will want him to do something for her too. And Reg? Yeah. This is one that you may end up regretting. In a pretty fun sequence, Nanachi, using a thin, gauzy blanket as a prop, explains how she perceives the curse and the force field as something not dissimilar to said cloth, a sort of omnipresent membrane. You can move down without issue, but moving upwards ruptures the membrane and you get zotzed. This gets a bit more odd when Nanachi goes on to explain that the creatures of the abyss, including hollows, can actually perceive this energy, and that's how the piercer was able to predict Reg's movements. Meaning that, once again, there are some timey-wimey shenanigans going on. Starting to notice a theme, the pair do bond somewhat, as Nanachi, directing Reg, helps him to defeat the orb piercer in another pretty neat sequence that I actually don't understand. See, she explains 
that the only way to beat the Pierce's ability to see the future is to uncouple your thoughts and your movements, and essentially fight from instinct. But hang on a second. The Piercer isn't reading your mind, right? It's reading the near future. So how does that work? And yes, I know I'm probably misunderstanding this one, but it is what it is. I'm sure you will let me know in the comments. Regardless, yeah, again, it's a really entertaining little action and exposition beat that manages to create a fairly endearing camaraderie between the robot and the bunnykins in ugh, what is also going to be another example of this series' tonal whiplash. What do I mean? Once they're done, Nanachi reveals Reg's side of the deal. She wants him to kill Mitty. Ah, Tsukushi, mate. Who hurt you? It's okay. You can tell Daddy Owl because cheesy Pete. And this leads us to that part of Made in Abyss. You know, the one that, if you search for the anime on YouTube, is what will immediately come up. Because this sequence is notorious. Alrighty then, let's do it. As an aside, while I was recording this bit, an enormous thunderstorm was passing overhead. And damn it, that is rather apropos. We start by getting a bit of Nanachi's backstory. An indeterminate time ago, she was a street kid who lived in abject filth and poverty. And later, along with other street kids, was recruited by, oh, that's not good, Bondrude, in order to help him forge a path to the Netherworld's next era. They set out with the help of his very odd-looking assistants, who we will later learn are known as the Umbra Hands, and travel a whopping 13 kilometers below the surface, deep into the oceanic layer. Later, she befriended another young girl, who, yup, that's Mitty. And while there was something a bit off in a sort of the promised Neverland way about their accommodations, what with horrible screaming late at night that Nanachi attributed to a bird, everything seemed mostly okay. At least they had food to eat. Things got more ominous when Nanachi overheard Bondrood in a discussion with a cave raider who expressed his concern at the White Whistle, bringing children down to Layer 5 for an unknown purpose. Bondrood brushed him off with some more pretty ominous lines and, yeah, I love how Bondrood looks here. It's almost as if Tsukushi uses a different art style, creating an otherworldly effect almost as if Bondrood doesn't quite belong in this reality. And, yup, before too long, we get to see what's been going on. Bondrood takes the pair and places them into an elevator-like contraption consisting of two chambers, all the while explaining what's about to happen to them. He's experimenting in order to find a way to return from layer 6 safely without mutating and losing your humanity. This contraption diverts the curse from both chambers into one, ideally sparing the Nutshi at the expense of Mitty. And as the two plead for mercy, they are lowered down, and after the elevator comes to rest in a swarm of unmentionable gibbering horrors, 
it starts to rise, and yeah, this happens. We get to watch as a shrieking Mitty twists, ruptures, and collapses as she screams for someone to kill her, until finally all that remains is that. Nachi, on the other hand, somehow mutated into her, yeah I'll go right ahead and say it, her furry bait form, albeit being left massively traumatized. Bondrude, curious about this effect, kept her around to, yeah again, remember this, help him with his unspeakable research, which, oof, oh boy, also happened to include Mitty. See, not only was she mutated into that nightmare, but she was also rendered utterly immortal, which Bondrude naturally tried to understand by constantly mutilating and eviscerating Mitty in every way he could think possible, testing the limits of her immortality while gradually distorting her form further. Jeez! Eventually, this led Nanachi to grab Mitty and flee. Oh, and this. This is just heartbreaking. Remember when they heard the screams in Bondrude's lab and attributed them to a bird? Well, Nanachi went and made a plushie of this imaginary bird for Mitty. Things only got worse though. Nanachi now resolved to put her friend out of her misery, only ended up making Mitty suffer more, trying everything she could think of to kill her, but only succeeded in doing exactly what Bondrude was doing, inflicting more pain and misery onto her poor friend. She even resorted to experimenting on mortally injured cave raiders, which, yeah, explains her medical and anatomical knowledge from earlier, having become, in essence, something like a lesser version of the man she loathed. Back in the present, the Nachi reveals why she believes Reg might be their one hope. Bondrude possesses a great number of powerful relics, but one of his most infamous is Sparagmos, which out of interest, is an obscure Greek term best translated as divine sacrificial dismemberment. Yeah, you'll actually see a lot of nods and resonances with themes and visuals from Greek myth around Nanachi, Bondrude, and this arc. I wonder why. Regardless, according to her, Sparagmos is something similar to Reg's incinerator. It seems to utterly obliterate anything it touches, and the wound Sparagmos inflicted on Mitty is the only one that won't heal. Reg is naturally hesitant to straight up murder what was, at least once, an innocent child, but Nanachi tells him that it's okay, he doesn't have to do this, and that she will continue to heal Riko regardless. Reg is left at an absolute quandary, wondering what will happen to Nanachi if she'll be okay if he were to follow through. Yeah mate, I wonder. Sometime later, we see that Reg is no closer to a decision, and to her credit, Nanachi hasn't mentioned the matter again. Despite his obvious moral misgivings about what she has asked of him, he does feel like he owes the strange creature immensely. However, demonstrating a decent amount of intelligence in a nice little bit of character growth, Rake decides to learn as much as he can about the situation before he decides. He asks Nanachi 
if she thinks Mitty is truly unhappy living together with her here, Nanachi explains herself a bit further. And yeah, in some more interesting resonance with Greek myth, particularly the fate of Prometheus, Nanachi knows that after she eventually dies, Mitty will be left behind, utterly immortal but also defenseless, and would thus live on forever in a cycle of being endlessly fed upon by the creatures of the no, no, shh, not yet, we'll get to you, mate, and regenerating. Reg also notices that, despite the Nachi's nonchalant mannerisms and superficially blasé attitude, she is despair-ridden and teetering right on the edge of a complete emotional collapse. Think this can't get any sadder? Well, Reg puts the truth together and confirms his concerns from earlier. After she found a way of killing Mitty, Nanachi plans on ending her own life, bloody hell, Keep in mind that this is a kid, by the way. Tsukushi, mate. Now, beginning to sob, Reg forces her to promise not to do it, to which she reluctantly agrees, and he, in turn, agrees to kill Mitty, as Nanachi comforts him. She places Mitty outside, on a comfortable pillow, with all of the stuffed animals and toys that she made for her. Reg prepares to fire, but Mitty's head rises as Nanachi screams out for him to wait. She rushes over to hug and comfort her friend, apologizing profusely before, in easily one of my favorite panels from the entire manga, Nanachi pulls herself away and, before she can change her mind, gives Reg the order. With his eyes filled with tears, Reg fires, and Mitty disintegrates, leaving him sobbing and Nanachi shrieking in anguish. After a time, the two fall into each other's arms and finally start to calm down as Reg offers what comfort he can. And yeah, holy crap, this really should be on those top 5 saddest anime or manga moments lists because that entire sequence is just sadness marinated in misery. It's like the ending of Jock of the Bushvelts had a baby with all yellow and named it Fluke. Seriously, what is it with all the depressing dog stories? Ugh. And I wish, I absolutely wish, that I could tell you that this is the saddest moment in the manga. Regardless, this ends the volume, except we get a very brief epilogue. The scene shifts over to a darkened laboratory. Somewhere else, someone is observing their actions. Yup. Good luck, you three. Far beneath your feet, on layer 5, Bondrood the novel, Sovereign of Dawn, is waiting for you. So, where were we? Oh right, we cut forward a short but indeterminate distance in time. Reg wakes to see a now up and about Rikor doing 
something with Nanachi. And we get a sequence of panels that, you know, honestly, let's just take a look. Because these are amazing, but in a fairly subtle way. It's all in the expressions. Rico turns, sees Reg, then takes a moment to gather herself, smiles, and greets him. That's... yeah, man. Say what you like about Tsukushi being a gigantic pervy weirdo that probably needs to be on a whole bunch of watch lists, but the man knows his stuff. Turns out that Riko is teaching the Nachi to cook, and that's all I swear. <laughs> okay, okay. Before your mind goes where apparently about half the internet's minds went, there is actually a lot of weirdness with Reg and Rico constantly touching and snuggling up to everyone's second favorite floof monster. Yes, her accepted, we'll get to her. Which Nanachi complains about from time to time, as apparently their touching can be Mmm, a little lewd. And at the time, this led folks to surmise an attraction or more between either Reg and the Nachi or Rico and the Nachi, but mostly the former. However, as we'll learn later, the Nachi didn't just gain a pleasing form, she also gained an irresistible scent. And Yes, that image is real. Japan is just such an odd place sometimes. The why of this aroma? Well, we will get to that later. According to Tsukushi, it smells a bit like candy floss. Which, yes, would be cotton candy if you live in America. He did explain in an interview, though, that it's not what people think. Apparently, Reg and Rico's constant touching is actually just an almost infantile, tactile fascination with the creature. And nothing more, you weird, thirsty people out there who, for some reason, really want to see a robot on kangaroo porn. I swear the internet was a mistake. Also, does food in anime and manga always manage to look better than any real food, or is it just that I haven't eaten breakfast yet? Yeah, imagine not being able to find 10 minutes to eat food. Ha, huh, parenthood. Regardless, this is actually a pretty sweet scene that isn't spelled out for the audience at all. See, Nanachi was a street kid who basically survived eating garbage. As a hollow, she had no idea how to prepare food, and while she knew enough to put heat to meat, she didn't clean or prepare the carcass at all, and so it was inevitably disgusting and tasted like poo. So Rico, a double black diamond survivalist cook has taken the Fufikins under her wing and is teaching her how to prepare a meal within the abyss, leading to another fantastic panel. Ah, Nanachi got ratatouille. That's just awesome. Oh, and we jump into another sequence that I totally forgotten about until this reread, but I have to wonder if. This is going to be important later. We see that Rico is having, or at least had, a very odd coma dream. She was trapped underground in a claustrophobic, constricting place. And okay, I am going to have a stab at interpreting this, but as I may be wrong, I'm curious to what Pooty or you folks think this is all about. I have a feeling that she is seeing what Mitty's transformation must have felt like from her side, being compressed, crushed, and ripped apart, losing the ability to communicate and all sense of self. 
However, she then encounters another child in this strange dreamscape, experiencing similar torment, until Rico smells burning and the child stops crying. This must have been Reg doing, yeah, that. Jeez Louise, this manga man. Oh, and we then get to see, what the hell is that? That is freaky as balls. I think it's supposed to be Mitty's soul. And after all of that is done, Riko was left with a sense that they would meet again. Ah ha 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 ha, well then. Oh, thanks, Freddy, foreshadowing. Reg reminds us about Rico's resurrection and that she probably has a unique connection to the Abyss. And yeah, I forgot just how much cryptic foreshadowing these early to middle volumes contained. Made in Abyss, even though the first few volumes are rather a bit slow in places, it is still astonishing how much story is packed into this thing and how clearly Tsukushi knew where at least some parts of the story were going right from the get-go. That's just quality writing that. Regardless, now that Riko has at least partially recovered, the trio spend some time together. At some point, Nanachi takes them to a special hidden hot spring, which yeah, again, was actually another pretty gorgeous little zone in the game. However, this sequence is ugh, just all sorts of weird and uncomfortable, as there's a lot of nudity and innuendo, it's really awkward, so everyone in favour of skipping, yep. Great idea. Sometime later, the parasitic mushrooms are being removed in another unnecessarily gross sequence that I'm not going to show you here. Spoiler, we don't see much gore, but we do get to watch Riko piss herself, so no thanks. However, we also get to see the results of Nanachi's ministrations. While the hand was retained, and the thumb is capable of some limited movement, the rest of Riko's hand is now mostly a useless chunk of meat. Thanks to severe nerve damage, mostly inflicted during Reg's battlefield surgery. However, Riko remains upbeat. Oh yeah, this bit is kind of fun too. Riko asks Nanachi if she would consider joining their party. Damn it, Nanachi, you're really adorable. And she basically just says K. Aww. While Riko and Reg are overjoyed, he privately suspects that despite her claim that it's to somehow satisfy Mitty, it might actually be because of Riko's cooking. Which again, yeah, a really charming little sequence. I suspect that it's deliberately so, because if you really want to scar people, you need to set them up first, you know, lull them into a full sense of security. It's why this show scared so much crap out of kids. Still, excited to be back on her way down to the bottom of the abyss, Riko cheers, and after the party, makes a few final preparations, including Nanachi building a pretty damn impressive brace for Riko's maimed hand. Wait, when did Nanachi become such an engineering whiz? Regardless, soon it's time for the party, now with an additional member to depart, with a last look at her home. Nanachi and the others leave, striking out for the depths of Layer 4, and beyond that, the mysterious subterranean ocean of Layer 5. 
Oh, you. If only you knew what was waiting for you there. The horror. Sometime later, we rejoin the party as they work their way through the spiral ice pillars and emerge onto a small plateau and an incredible sight. An enormous field of flowers covering an immense expanse of rolling hills spreading out and away as far as the eye can see. A place known as the Garden, marking the middle point of Layer 4. Reg immediately remembers this place from his dream of Liza's burial mount, but is snapped back to reality by the sudden awareness of something. Sure enough, it's a party of cave raiders. By the looks of it, they're in some trouble. Oh, and this is also interesting. We learn that Nanachi is capable of reading not only the ebb and flow of curse and force field, but also the emotions of others. Wait, what? Okay, Tsukushi, I guess I'll roll with it for now, but I do hope that this stuff gets explained one day. Riko, however, calls a warning. Looking through a telescope, she spots this weird-looking bastard, carrying some sort of contraption on its back, making its way over to the stricken raider group. Nanachi identifies him as a Black Whistle Tear Cave Raider, part of Bondrood's squad, the Umbra Hands. Reg, remembering Nanachi's horrific story, prepares to whoa straight up fire on the stranger with the incinerator, which, oh yeah, I was waiting for a good place to work this in, but a more accurate translation for the Japanese name of this weapon is cremation cannon, which is just so metal. Why didn't we go with that? But the umbra hand moves so fast that it appears he vanished, reappearing right in front of Reg. Oh, you're so outclassed right now, it's not even funny. Reg, nonetheless, appears game for a scrap, but the strange man tosses him. Oh right, Recall lost Blaze Reap a bit back. Did you forget about it? Don't worry, I think the story did too. And warns them that this area is off limits. And to be quiet, lest the party wake them. Yeah, it is entirely possible to pronounce a capital letter sometimes. Nanachi tells Reg to stand down. This is not a fight that they would be capable of winning right now. A black whistle would be a touch beyond their capabilities. However, she also wonders to herself how long Bondrood must have been watching them. Reg asks the hand what the hell he's doing, but he doesn't respond. Riko spots something weird amongst the flowers. A large, vicious-looking insect, camouflaged as a leaf. We cut back over to Reg at the campsite, and he balks as he sees, oh, what the hell is that? An eyeless, delirious cave raider with a partially eaten away face. And the Umbra Hand explains. The bug that Rikor saw is part of a colony of similar nasty critters, unbelievably dangerous and very similar to parasitoid wasps. These are called amaranthine deceptors. Oh, and more weirdness, according to the Umbra Hand, these creatures have utterly infested the entire flower garden, but they do not belong up on layer 4. 
They are a much deeper threat and are very out of place here. Even stranger, he says that they are lying doggo and waiting for a signal? Nope. I don't think that the manga has ever explained this as of yet, and I have no idea what the hell is going on. But, as Recall confirms, it appears that these creatures have been cultivated by someone. Wakuna? Srajo? Liza? Nope, no idea. Regardless, Amaranthine Deceptors are pretty much an existential threat, especially if they were to infest the upper layers. They lay their larvae inside living creatures and are kept alive for as long as possible as a sort of living incubator. Before they can say anything, the Umbra Hand reveals what was on his back as he flicks on a frigging flamethrower and flares the entire flower field in another just utterly beautiful and yet strangely eerie scene. I know this one is a fan favorite, so I would be remiss in not showing you. Reg yells at him that there was a party of cavers still I guess mostly alive down there, and prepares to go in on the attack. Although he might have meant that he wanted to go in and attempt to rescue them. We'll go with the former as it's cooler, and yeah. The Umbra Hand basically turns to him and goes, you what, before telling him to beat feet and go back to his friends. Oh, and that Bondrood is waiting for them down below. That's... Oof, that's not good. The party narrowly escapes the conflagration and are left looking down onto the once tranquil field. Now a sea of fire. And yes, if the flower field burning isn't a perfect analogy for this entire manga, I am honestly not sure what would be. The party makes camp, and Nanachi explains what lies ahead. Down below layer 4 is the beautiful and dangerous layer 5. However, that's where things get tricky. There is only one entrance to layer 6, and that entrance lies at the heart of Edor Front, an enormous fortress belonging to Bondrood himself. Nanachi warns the party that, in order to get down below, some sort of encounter with the sinister mad scientist White Whistle is likely to be unavoidable. Yeah, remember when I called this manga anxiety porn? This is the sort of stuff I am referring to. Sure enough, now at the very bottom of layer 4, the party catches their first glimpse of layer 5 in another utterly perfect panel staring at the hellish way down. A chaotic, skeletal-looking ridgeline of crystalline walkways plunging down into an almost infinitely big waterfall. I will say that, while I do like the anime adaptation of Maiden Abyss a lot, a big part of why is the stuff that is excluded more than the adaptation in and of itself. And one of the things that I consider to be a substantial downgrade is the geography and appearance of Layer 5. It's hard to express, but there's something lost in translation here in regards to the scale and general alienness of this place. They carefully begin making their way down, and at some point, Reg takes a dip into the ocean and catches a... <clears throat> yeah, I'm just gonna say it. 
That's a penis fish, looking like something out of From a Buick 8. But apparently it's really testy, I mean tasty, when eaten as sashimi. And we get another nice little break as the party eats. Oh, and Riko's sure that the bottom of the abyss must be a wonderful place? Huh? Why? No, seriously, girly. What in the past three volumes has given you any indication that the abyss isn't going to be some kind of Lovecraftian nightmare? <sighs> we see the party make their way down through layer 5, a bizarre alien biome consisting of huge expanses of fathomless turbulent water, precarious bone-like crystalline structures, which we are later informed is crystallized water? So ice? No, and as far as I know, that's never explained. As well as white, almost snow-like sandbars, they finally reach an outcrop and look down, out, and over their destination. The immense circular fortress of Edor Front. At its center, a beam of light punches skywards, marking the mysterious descent down through the subterranean ocean to layer 6 and the lower abyss. Oh, and it's not terribly obvious here, but that big weird cylinder above the fortress, that's all water, somehow suspended in the sky. Well, for a given value of sky, we do get a bit of exposition, courtesy of Nanachi, but nothing especially important, just reminding the reader of stuff mentioned previously, and without any other options, the trio start cautiously making their way down towards the fortress. Assumably, they intend to try and slip in avoid detection and sneak over to the entrance to layer 6. Yeah, all of you, tread very carefully here. As they approach the fortress, Nanachi tells Reg that, if his origin truly is the Lower Abyss, he must have swum up through the ocean, as he is both curse immune and does not need to breathe. As they sneak, they are startled when they hear a footstep. They turn and see that it's this character, a young girl with an odd hat and strange almost Ozen-like hair, marking her as a long-time resident of the Abyss. Yup, meet Pushka, a character that people who have read this before, or watched the anime, are immediately grimacing about because, yeah. Without any spoilers, this character makes people cry like the ending of the Green Mile. We will get there. Oh, and note, Prushka asks the party if they are Papa's guests. Regardless, she escorts them into the fortress, and with no other option presenting itself, they reluctantly follow. Making their way in, we see that they are all quite rightfully leery of the chatty little newcomer due to the fact that they are essentially being led into the lion's den here, but she seems earnest enough, even hurt by their suspicions. And, well, she does rapidly win them over, and they all exchange names. However, as Nanachi is about to respond, she feels a deep chill come over her, as Prushka turns, shouts, and happily rushes over to her papa. Well, shit. Sure enough, Prushka's papa is Bondrude himself, who emerges, flanked 
by a large number of his intimidating Umbra Hand minions. Yup, here we go. Meet Bondroot. If Nanachi is the fan favorite character and unofficial series mascot, then this dude is definitely the runner up. And yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. With his resonant, almost at times sepulchral voice, impeccable manners, and strange paradoxical elegance. I mean, the dude wears a frigging cravat over steampunk armor. That's just baller. Bondrude is a creature of contradictions. But aside from that, he also, without a doubt, has one of the coolest designs I have ever seen. The intricate armor, the awesome vertical light of his faceplate, and uh, yeah, we'll get into more when it comes up, but ugh. remember when I said that Orzen was one of two characters that I found it difficult to really get a handle on? Yeah, Bondrood is the second. And this right here is one of the reasons why. He immediately approaches a terrified Nanachi and greets her with genuine warmth, expressing joy that they were able to euthanize Mitty and move on. He does honestly seem really happy to see her. Yeah, this is a bit confusing. Reg isn't having any of it though, and angrily begins to confront him before Nanachi desperately grabs him and tries to stop him. Kind of like that one drunk mate who has a tendency to get into arguments with bikers. Instead, she tells Bondru that they don't want any trouble and are only passing through. To Rico and Reg's astonishment, Bondru appears nonchalant, saying that they can go right ahead. But he does ask them exactly what their plan was and reminds us of something that the audience and by the looks of it the characters seem to have forgotten. To move down beyond layer 5 requires a white whistle, the relic, not the person, and not just any white whistle at that. See, a white whistle can only be used by its original owner, whatever that means. Rikor, thus, cannot use Liza's whistle to get beyond the boundary, meaning that even if Bondrude were to let them access the gateway, there is no way for them to move down further beyond layer 5. I honestly have no idea what their plan was, and by the sounds of it, neither does Rico. Even more shocking to all present though, is Bondrude's treatment of Prushka. The evil mad scientist does seem to be genuinely affectionate towards her, and indeed rather fatherly, with the bond between them seeming legitimately wholesome. What in the hell is going on? Don't worry, all this weirdness will make sense eventually. Kind of. Anyway, to let the party rest and to give them time to mull things over, Bondrude offers the trio rooms in Edo Front, saying that he prepared those in advance. Uh, but without any other obvious options, the party follows Prushka in, who shows them to their quarters and also explains to be careful of the toilets? as falling in would be lethal. <laughs> yeah, Tsukushi, there's a sequel manga in there that I want to read. She also reminds them to beware the stairs, as the curse on layer 5 is no joke, even compared to that on layer 4. We also get to see that Riko and Prushka are rapidly becoming firm friends. Prushka, as it so happens, has spent her entire life in the abyss, having never seen the surface, and this leads to a really entertaining exchange about the dawn. However, 
we do get to see that despite the irrepressible newcomer, the party, but in particular Nanachi, are still very much ill at ease. It doesn't quite click with her that Bondrood could have been experimenting on kids in such a cavalier and horrific fashion, while his daughter, yes, before anyone corrects me, we do learn later that she is adopted, who he does legitimately seem to care about, was down here. And you know what? If I was to be honest, I don't fully understand this either, but we will go into this more in the next volume. In short, the Nachi suspects that Prushka might be some sort of Judas goat. He says, realizing that he grew up on farms and basically nobody will know what that means. Yeah, there's something for you to Google, chaps and chapettes. Judas goat. It's really interesting. Yes, I am a dad now, and that means I can give you homework. While Riko and Prushka chat, Nanachi and Reg are having their own little get-together. The pair realize that Reg's incinerator, or yes, cremation cannon, see, Nanachi uses it here, and damn it I love that name, is absurdly powerful, even more so than Reg and Riko had initially guessed. It appears not only capable of blasting the hell out of things, but it's so powerful that it can straight up burn things out of reality, rewriting the rules of the abyss. So it's basically balefire. Cool. However, this power does come at a price. It drains an inordinate amount of energy to fire, and based on the Nazi's experience with relics and a symbol that appears on Reg's helmet LCD thing, she estimates that he still has three shots remaining to him at max. Once all three are depleted, Reg will be fully drained and will likely become totally inert. So yeah, that's not good. Reg worries about how he'll protect them from Bondrood if needed, to which Nanachi has no response. We cut over to some time later that night, if that term has any relevance this deep in the abyss. Nanachi realizes how bad their predicament is. Things could go sideways very, very fast here, and worse, there's no way to push forward now. As they lack the white whistle, they would need to reach layer 6. With no answer presenting itself, and frustrated with her lack of options, she, assumably, beds down to sleep alongside Riko and Reg. And now, with everyone settling in for a nice stay at Edel Front, a place where absolutely nothing horrible is going to happen at all. The stage is set for this manga to really get moving. Yup, Tsukushi has been playing our nerves like violin strings, and it's time for things to get, well, made in abyss again. Before that begins, I think we would all be better off for a quick break. Hey folks, this is The Owl. Ever feel like you need more owl in your life? Enjoy watching middle-aged men get the butt pains about losing at video games? Like chatting about anime, manga, comics, movies, games, food, science, and, I don't know, the news while doing so? Well, why not sign up to our Twitch? We stream every week on Friday evenings and Sunday afternoons, as well as random streams throughout the week. You might even hear Baby Owl being adorable. Oh, and if you're interested in something different, 
but particularly Dungeons and Dragons. Mrs. Owl now has a channel of her own. Go and check it out. It is going to be amazing. As always, all links are in the description. Anyways, back to the nightmare. Our perspective shifts over to Rico, who wakes up deep in the night, needing to go and shake the lettuce. She looks around, wondering where her friends are, uh-oh, but stumbles out, glary-eyed, looking for the Kazi. Now, as we proceed into the latter half of Volume 4, and we go again from cutesy adventure, to anxiety porn, to sheer and utter nightmare, I want you to keep a close eye on the artwork, because I cannot give Tsukushi enough credit for just how well he does this stuff. Not just in terms of raw art, or his always top-notch panelling, but in terms of his line work and colouring, and how he changes style as the tone and mood of the manga shift. When things are happy, or at least benign, we get a soft, almost children's bedtime story feel. Gentle shading and shadows, and solid colouring. However, when things get ominous, or we begin to switch into horror, we get much harsher lines, an almost sketchy style at times, stronger contrasts, and deep, dark blacks. It's effective. Still a bit concerned about her friends, Rico concludes that they must have gone to the bathroom together. What? No, that's just so odd. Regardless, she does find the loo herself and, yeah, Rico. <laughs> it's one of those Japanese squatty parties. After I accidentally dunked my nuts in cold water for the twelfth time, I stopped using them. But yes, in reality, she's probably worried about Pushka's story about man-eating toilets or whatever that was. A bit later, after she, yeah, to be honest, she probably found a quiet corner somewhere, we see that Rikor is now getting extremely worried about Reg and the Nachi, and she has started to explore the almost deserted seeming base, but she doesn't find them. After a time, the only path she hasn't explored is the stairs and the upstairs area. Oh, oh no, Riko, don't you even think about it. Remember what Prushka, oh yeah, you're doing it. Riko climbs the stairs because Riko is occasionally a complete idiot. She reasons that the fifth layer curse, total sensory deprivation and allegedly self-injurious behaviour, don't sound anywhere near as bad as hemorrhage and agony on layer 4. But she does prepare to sit down in the stairwell immediately if she feels the curse coming on. But it doesn't, and so she continues up. Oh yes, there's one thing to correct from my last video. In the game, the curses were cumulative. For instance, if you got hit by the curse on layer 4, you would also get the effects of layers 1 through 3. However, the manga does not operate under this rule. Each layer's curse is distinct and bound within that layer. Riko continues to climb up, keeps going, and suddenly she feels something choking her. She reaches into her mouth and pulls out, oh what the hell. Because this manga is literally recreating my nightmares, it's several shattered teeth. She then notices that something is not quite right. The darkness around her appears to be shifting, reaching out and opening deep slashes in her body, but there's no pain. 
Realizing that this must somehow be the fifth layer curse at work, Riko prepares to sit down, but she can't find down or back. And yeah, the entire manga starts tripping all piercer balls as Riko loses all sense of direction, sensation, and self as her consciousness begins to implode in a very cool sequence of panels. She wakes up, hearing Prushka calling her name. It turns out that her new friend heard her screaming and came to her aid. She explains what happened, at least from her perspective. Riko, not realizing that she'd been cursed or much of anything at the time, had unwittingly fallen straight down the stairs and badly messed herself up. See, Riko, you need to listen. The Layer 5 curse is really frigging nasty. Prushka explains a bit more. People affected by this curse grind their teeth and shatter them and will go right on messing themselves up without realizing it until they are literally dead. What a terrifying prospect. Riko does explain why she went out and tried to climb the stairs, and Prushka agrees to help her look after she does, admitting that, yeah, something here is very wrong. The entire base is locked down. They will indeed have to take the stairs. But what about the curse? Well, Prushka reveals that she has a way around it, and reveals that she carries what? a small creature under her hat that, wait, hang on, that's Patamon from Digimon. What the hell? No, of course it's not, but those designs are uncannily similar. This is Mania, Prushka's pet. It's a weirdly off-putting, stinky little thing that apparently was inspired by the smelly old parrot that Tsukushi's family once owned. That's just really funny, to be honest. And this is explained a bit later, but assumably breathing Mania's dust makes you temporarily immune to the curse. Are these creatures rare or something? Because that strikes me as really useful for cave raiders. With Mania's help, the pair ascends, and Riko asks the obvious question. What the hell is up with Prushka and her ostensible father, Bondrood? She responds that she absolutely adores her dad, and that he dotes on her. Yeah, again, Bondrood is a confusing character. Depending on who you ask, he is either ingeniously and fiendishly complex, or he's completely inconsistent and incoherent in terms of his character and motivations. We will do a proper character drill down maybe next volume, because the one thing Bondrude is, is weird, and we've barely even scratched the surface of said weirdness. That said, as I hinted at earlier, yeah. Made in Abyss has three sequences that I genuinely struggle to get through. There's that bit in Volume 3, another bit coming later, yeah, just watch out for this character, oh boy, and the bit that comes next. Okay, let's do this. <laughs> We shift over to see Nanachi and Bondrood, and is it just me, or is this panel kind of weird? I'm not sure what it is, maybe the compositing. Anyways, we get some clarification. Prushka is indeed adopted, and after Nanachi asks the inevitable question, Bondrood pontificates about love for a bit, yeah, again. Weird, confusing character. We do get some more information about the other White Whistles, though. Both Surajo and Wakuna 
are down in the lower abyss, and Bonrood implies that both have the ability to access Layer 6 while bypassing Edel Front. However, Bonrood does drop some interesting tidbits too. The other white whistles, as per the last dive, are now stuck in the lower abyss. But Bonrood's research, yeah, remember that horror show has progressed to the point where he has a way around this. Somehow, Bondrood can head down to layer 6 and safely return to layer 5. While she tries not to show it, this discussion plunges Nanachi even further into despair. Her last hope was getting the help of one of the other White Whistles to save them all from Bondrood. And yeah, speaking of anxiety porn, this next bit really gets under my skin. Bondrood, for reasons that will be explained later, clearly wants Nanachi back as an assistant, and she, now utterly hopeless, agrees on the condition that he let Riko and Reg go. They need to be allowed to leave without harm, and he needs to help them to get down to layer 6, so they can continue their quest without her. To which, Bondrood replies, whoops, well shit, and here we go. This next bit is, yeah, I can't really show you much of it. It is explicit, and it is nasty. We see that Reg is being vivisected by the Umbra Hands, who have already removed one of his arms. Nanachi barges in, and they begin to swarm around her, calling out the term Blessed. Remember that. They are stopped by the sudden arrival of Prushka and Riko, the latter of whom nearly passes out after seeing her friend now maimed and bleeding heavily. Prushka, in a fury, begins chewing them out and saying that she will tell her father as these were his guests, but they appear unperturbed and instead begin advancing on her, pointing to a very nasty looking chair. Oh dears. However, before they can grab her, Prushka is suddenly yanked backwards as Riko grabs her and a briefly conscious Reg uses his remaining arm to pull them out of range, and they flee. Some time later, Reg has passed out again, and the rest are trying to figure out what the hell to do next. Nanachi says that evidently Bondrood planned this all out from the start. This is the reason that he allowed them to take shelter in Edel Front. It was to make them complacent enough to capture so he could experiment on them. Without any other options, Prushka bravely agrees to stay behind and intercede on her new friend's behalf. She is convinced that some of the Umbra Hands have gone rogue and that her father means them no harm. She leads them to a hidden jetty and they make their escape. As they go, Prushka reveals that she wants to join them on their adventure, and the last they see of her, it's as the Umbra Hands surround her. Some time later, we see the party making landfall on a white sandbar, a goodly way away from the fortress. They have escaped, but at a serious cost. Reg's arm has been left behind, and Prushka resigned to an uncertain fate. Riko starts to break down, but Nanachi is furious. Yeah, Bondrood is a straight up bastard. She wants to come up with some sort of plan to maybe strike back at him, if possible to save Prushka before anything bad can happen to her. And you know what? If the volume had ended right here, 
I would have been perfectly satisfied. But nope, we've still got one bit to come, and it is a humdinger. We see that Nanachi is tending to a still unconscious wreck. When a large shadow falls across her, she looks up to see... Oh, oh boy. Bondrood and several Umbra hands are standing right behind her. Bondrood instructs Nanachi to come with him and offers to repair Reg if she does. She, however, responds by telling him to get bent as Riko leaps down, swinging Blaze Reap, striking the ground and causing an immense blast. Bondrood appears to be at least mildly surprised, but this all appears to be a part of whatever plan is being carried out. Spoiler, it's one hell of a plan, and this kicks off just, oh man, such a great sequence. As, with Bondru displaced and now awake Reg, winches Nanachi and him into the air and out of the madman's reach. She taunts Bondrood, telling him to look down as something happens. We briefly cut back in time, and in a very anime scene. You know, the bit where we retroactively see the protagonist's plan being formed. Riko, as a certified Abyss nerd, uses her mother's notes and figures out something about the sandbar they landed on. It turns out that a huge nest of the most dangerous monster on layer 5, colossal, ridiculously venomous, seven-tailed scorpions called Stingerheads. Dumb name, awesome monster. And sure enough, these things go through the Umbra hands like butter, as we get to see just how dangerous their stings are, as one of them gets stung, then ugh, immediately swells, ruptures, and then essentially liquefies. Wow, that's awesomely nasty stuff. More like this, please, and less like, well, that. But we do see that Riko can barely tear her eyes away from the carnage. Yeah, I wouldn't be horrified. Well done, you lot. That was actually dope as. We do, however, get a nifty little bit of foreshadowing as Reg tells the party that he can still feel his missing arm somehow, and with Bondru defeated and likely dead, they decide to pick it up from Edo Front as they pass through. And with that, they prepare to depart. The scene shifts again over to the orphanage. Oh, hey Hubble, it's been a while, mate. He's busy lecturing some novice raiders and, coincidentally, teaching them about Bondrood. Apparently, the mad scientist managed to revolutionize cave raiding in a wide variety of ways, not only in terms of technique, but also in terms of technology. However, the novices ask him why Bondrood has such a dark reputation if he was so essential to the modern art of cave raiding. And Hubble reveals that it's because Bondrood, despite being a genius, has positively no scruples, no standards or boundaries. If human experimentation is required, he will do it. If there is an outbreak, he will nuke the area. If he needs money, he will sell weaponized relics on the black market. Yeah, okay. If you squint hard enough here, Tsukushi might be making a point about some of the things Japan got up to during World War II as 
There is a definite similarity between some of the things Bondru does and the real life Unit 731. Don't Google it. Trust me. And before someone says that I'm reaching here, well, it wouldn't be the first time a modern mangaka made an overt reference to this. Yeah, Kohei Horikoshi, you've got some balls, mate. Anyway, we also learn from Hubble that Bondrude, due to some of the things he's done, is a globally wanted criminal, and that there is a hefty bounty on him, but he's so absolutely and absurdly powerful that nobody even bothers trying to catch him. We also get another brilliant panel as Hubble describes Bondrude after meeting him as something utterly inhuman, wearing a people suit. And sure enough, back in the present, something starts to happen within the pack of Stingerheads. A narrow beam of light gleams out and then scythes through them, tearing them apart in an instant. And Bondrude steps out, completely unharmed. Yup. This is another quintessentially anime moment, but it's a good one. Sometimes cliches are cliches for a reason, and the villain easily survives patently unsurvivable situation to demonstrate that they're a badass is among my favorites. Completely baffled, the trio ask Nanachi what the hell just happened. It turns out that the beam of light was Spiragmos, Bondrude's equivalent of Reg's incinerator. An elbow-mounted projector. Is that a reference to Gaiva, by the way, rather than a hand? However, Minachi does notice something interesting. And remember this one for later. Spiragmos was used to maim and partially dismember the seemingly invulnerable Reg, but Bondrude wasn't present at the time. Huh? Did he trust an underling with his best weapon? And I don't think this ever really gets explained, but I think the implication is that with Bondrude's skill at fiddling with relics, he was probably able to somehow synthesize additional versions. Regardless, Nanachi realizes that Bondrude is somehow hijacking her vision. And no, at this point in the story, this too has not been explained or even really elaborated on further. Regardless, as it so happens, she has a backup plan. We also briefly cut away to see that Prushka is present, being guarded by an Umbra hand. Bondrude, as it so happens, is legitimately impressed by the party's ingenuity, but was aware of the Stingerheads from the start. Reg moves in to attack, but Bondrude easily deflects his strikes. Despite Reg's power and speed, the two are clearly not even in the same league. However, as it so happens, this rush was a cover for Reg to get a grenade-like relic in close, which goes off, blasting Reg back and distracting Bondrude long enough for Reg to fire his arm out and to latch onto his gauntlet, which he then uses to haul Bondrude's arm up and out, exposing a small gap in his armor and allowing Rico to shoot him with a crossbow bolt. He seems unperturbed, but we quickly see that this was no ordinary bolt. It was, in fact, full of amaranthine deceptor larvae. If you remember, those horrible Zerg Tyranid bugs from earlier. And yeah, I frigging love that the party's plan is to use the abyss itself, using their knowledge to weaponize it against the arch-villain. Before he can respond, 
Reg launches himself in again, driving the madman back and down into the water, preventing him from firing Sparagmos again. Then, with Bondrood in tow, Reg's arm snakes up, and we see the final part of the plan. With Nanachi's ability to see the force fields, they were able to determine something interesting about layer 5. Anything below the surface of the water is technically layer 6, as Reg hauls Bondrood up with him out of the water we see that the intention is to give him a taste of poetic justice. Infested, mutating, and badly damaged, Reg seals the deal with a massive boulder. Check, frigging, mate, you steampunk bastard. But realizing that he just killed someone, Reg is overcome with remorse as Nanachi apologizes to him. Nonetheless, the battle is won and the party chalk their first white whistle notch onto their belts. However, in a pretty fun and yet weirdly sad fake out, Nanachi turns with a look of horror on her face. But it's only Prushka. Oh damn, who rushes over and sobs over her dying father as the Umbra hand from earlier comforts her. Yeah, that sucks. As she mourns her father, the large umbra hand behind her steps forward and, what the hell, rips the helmet off what's left of the disintegrating corpse and puts it on, then turns and, sure enough, Bondrood the novel, Sovereign of Dawn, introduces himself properly. Oh, and he knocks Prushka out for some reason. Nope. I have no idea why, especially learning what we learn later. As it turns out, all of this was somehow according to his plan. Through some unknown means, he must have switched out with a substitute and, by the looks of things, a much weaker one. The entire battle and Reg ostensibly killing him was somehow all for Prushka's benefit. And yeah, as with so many things about this manga, it's really confusing. But on this one at least, hang in there, because we will learn at least a little bit more about this in Volume 5. And no, I promise you, if this is somehow your first encounter with Maiden Abyss, well, firstly, why? And secondly, it's not what you're thinking. The party once again tries to attack him, but this time it's completely pointless. He dispatches them almost nonchalantly, recall with a uh, complicated but let's say stun darts called shakers and reg with a strange tail-like appendage. We then get a brief revelation of sort of what's going on here. Bondrood is basically Mr. Sinister. Hmm, in more ways than one now that I think about it. All of the Umbra Hands are somehow Bondrood. And we will learn more about how exactly that works, you guessed it, in Volume 5. He also, however, mentions why he wants Nanachi back. This is important, by the way. Remember the Umbra Hands chanting Blessed earlier? Well, due to Mitty's willing acceptance of Nanachi's share of the curse, Nanachi wasn't just spared. She became something else entirely. A hollow, yes, 
but not the wretched mutant things like Missy or those creatures at the bottom of the pit. Something with a high form, immunity to the curse, and the ability to perceive the abyss in entirely new ways. A creature that I've dubbed a blessed hollow. With that though, Bondrood taunts them, telling them that they are always welcome back at Edor Front, and carrying Prushka, he takes his leave. Our last few pages of the volume I, whoa, cannot show you much of at all, because, well, all the nudity. But we see a naked Prushka lying on a table, looking slightly dazed but smiling, and talking to Bondrood, with him saying that they will now never be parted, and something about seeing the dawn together. Oh, you absolute bastard. And thus ends Volume 4. I wish I could tell you that this gets less dark with Volume 5, but uh, I will give you fair warning. Up until, well, this, Volume 5 was the one that people remembered. Volume 5 opens somewhat back in the past, showing us a bit more of Riko and Prushka, and how they've truly established a strong friendship, with the older girl gently teasing Riko, and also firing a stinky mania at her, okay? And yes, it's all very cute and wholesome. Riko explains that she doesn't just want to find her mother, she wants to continue adventuring in the abyss with Nanachi and Reg forever because Riko is clinically insane. Yes, yes, I know that for some reason people are obsessed with the abyss, but after a certain point, you've only got yourself to blame. We also learn a little bit about Prushka's background. Oh, don't you worry, we will get the whole shebang soonish and... It's a lot, but it turns out that my suspicions were correct, and her hair is indeed odd due to her falling victim to the fifth layer curse. As the interlude continues, we see that the irrepressible young girl, despite loving her mad scientist father deeply, had decided that she wanted to strike out on her own to join the party and go adventuring with her new friends to find the bottom of the abyss together before Riko wakes up in the present screaming. Yeah, that sucks. The party are all gradually recovering from their ass kicking at the hands of Bondrews. Rico is still sick from the after effects of his darts, Reg is pretty banged up, and Nanachi is naturally quite badly traumatized. Reg cannot really even pass out what happened to them. He was able to hold his own against Bondrood for a time, but when he moved to the more combat-ready body with the tail, which, out of interest, apparently that's a relic known as Third Works, Keep that information in mind for later, because there's something that really confuses me about said relic. He was able to completely overwhelm Reg and the others without any real difficulty. Rikor begins to catalogue 
the various relics that might help to explain just what the hell they observed, and tries to understand how Bondrood was able to, from her perspective, swap heads and thus bodies. Only Nanachi points out that the head itself is still there, Ugh. gently liquefying into a pile of goo and teeth. That's nasty. The only thing the new body took was his iconic mask. This twigs Rico onto what's going on. Apparently, Bondrood has been making use of a long lost and absurdly powerful relic that allows for the transference of consciousness between multiple bodies. Zoaholic, the soul slave machine, allowing him to attain pseudo immortality by having physical backups he can switch to at will. And yes, I know I got this wrong in my first attempt at this, but the reason the other Umbra Hand grabbed the mask? Well, it's implied that this is Bondrood's face to Prushka, that's all. Which, eh, okay, but I've always liked the idea of a head-swapping baddie. It's just so wonderfully macabre. Regardless, now feeling a bit more bucked up, as opposed to a word with one letter difference, the party dust themselves off and begin talking about what to do next. After some more discussion, they begin to have the inklings of a plan to rescue their new friend. Zoaholic is big, bulky, and immobile, so it must be kept somewhere within the reaches of Idorfront. If they were able to infiltrate the fortress, find this pivotal relic as the secret behind Bondrood's power, and succeed in destroying it, that would distract the mad scientist long enough for them to find their friend and escape. But that would likely involve a direct confrontation with him at some point. After all, every Umbra Hand in the fortress is, in a sense, bond root. Thus, in order to stand a chance if they were to challenge the powerful White Whistle again, they realize that they will need to find a way to recharge Reg. Rico reveals that he is essentially a bottomless pit for electricity. When she woke him up using the electric chair in Orth, it drained the entire city. He thus dives deep into the ocean beneath Edelfront, where the hydroelectric generator is located, with Nanachi and Rico returning to the fortress to create a distraction and buy him some time. In the bowels of the fortress, Reg encounters... Nope, I have absolutely no idea what's going on with this weirdness. A malformed man with a paper mache black whistle, who looks like he might be missing a portion of his head, huh? along with others doing menial tasks down here. And no, this never comes up again, and I don't think I have ever seen any more information on it, so yeah. What the hell? Bondrood has an army of zombie workers? Nope, no idea. Regardless, surrounded by all manner of weird, disturbing Dr. Frankenstein crap, Reg begins to freak out a little bit, but he does pull himself together remembering that he is doing this for Prushka's sake. Good luck, mate. You're going to need it. Meanwhile, Nanachi and Riko are recaptured and are being led along by another Umbra Hand when everything starts sparking and crackling and then the power cuts out. And here we go. This next bit... How on earth do I even do it justice? Well, let's try. Because this is where the manga starts to kick off.
Deep within the generator room, we see an enormous electrical burn, and as the smoke clears, something stands up from the charred center. It's Reg, and he looks like he's auditioning to join the gorillas. Seriously, there's something about this that's just haunting. Nanachi and Riko have, however, managed to slip away in the darkness. And once their escort wanders off looking for them, Riko switches on the headlamp and the entire fortress begins shaking. This must be Reg doing something. They prepare to use this distraction to go off and find Prushka when something grabs Riko from behind. But it's just Mania, and the weird little Digimon creature dashes off, seemingly beckoning them to follow. After making their way through the labyrinthine fortress, they find a large, ominous-looking door, behind which a very unpleasant little room, full of bizarre, wicked-looking instruments, hooks, gurneys, scalpels, and other implements, and oh, that's not good at all. What the hell is going on in here? And yup, here we go. As Nanachi begins to explain what Bondrood meant by his research on how to come and go from layer six, having progressed somewhat. Boys and girls, it's time we learned about cartridges, aka the most messed up thing in the manga before, ah <laughs> yes, people who've read volume eight get it. So, cartridges, Bondrood's new trick to move back up from layer six without getting mittied by the curse. Remember those orphans and street children that he collects and brings down to layer five with him? Much like what Nanachi and Mitty went through? Well, no longer do they just get an elevator ride. Instead, and yes, content warning here, the kids are flayed and vivisected before being put through a bizarre surgery. Their bones, skin, and most of their organs are removed to make them as small as possible, but they are still kept alive somehow, then crammed into a metallic casing to hold them together and ensure they don't just die. Bondrood then integrates these into his suit and hey presto, you've got a portable curse absorber. Still alive, still conscious, suffering all the while. Bloody hell! That is one of the most depraved things I have ever heard about. And to be frank, sort of confirms my suspicion about Bondrood being in many respects a nod to some of the stuff that Japan got up to during World War II, particularly the infamous Unit 731. Google it if you're interested, but just be warned. And from here, it just gets so much worse. Nanachi reveals that she, out of fear, assisted Bondrood, not only in developing these things, but also processing the children to make them. Yup, remember all that anatomical knowledge that she put to use helping Riko? Well, it didn't just come from experimenting on cave raiders. And that is, oh man, that's dark. As a guilt-stricken Nanachi begins having a full-on nervous breakdown, suddenly, with a boom, the doors are flung open and Bondrood, the real Bondrood as so far as that word holds any meaning for this body-hopping sociopath, greets them warmly and tells Nanachi that it's good to have her back. Despite her terror, she confronts him and accuses him of wanting to turn his own daughter into a cartridge, a possibility that a horrified Riko hadn't even considered until now. But he reassures them 
that Prushka is just sleeping at present. And once she's awake, he'd be happy to release her to them. However, he reveals that he hadn't even considered that this was a rescue mission. He thought that they'd returned to Edo Front to build Rico's White Whistle. And, surprise, surprise, we learn that these are crafted from a living human sacrifice. Because of course they are. Seriously, what is it in anime and manga with the big MacGuffin thing always requiring a human sacrifice? Oh, Japan. Except, as he explains, there's a bit more to it. See, it's not enough to just grab a random person and sacrifice them to make them into a whistle. For the whistle to be of any use, said person must sacrifice themselves willingly for the wielder. And yes, this is why a white whistle becomes inert unless wielded by the original user. Huh. This next bit is also really interesting, but we'll get into why that is somewhat later. He does tell Rico, however, that there are two ways down below, past the boundary altar. Either have a white whistle of your own, or become a white whistle for someone else. And this gives Rico a bizarre epiphany. Bondrude's own hands clasped together whistle is in fact forged from his own original body. He became his own sacrifice. And yeah, that's pretty damn metal. Bondrude, and yeah, again, this is the interesting part of this meeting, but we'll talk more about that later because it really is a nifty little bit of characterization for both of them, compliments Rico, and also indicates that he senses a lot of similarities between them. Which, yeah, huh. She, however, does make a very pertinent point. If Bondrude can change bodies at will, why is he doing this? Can't he just use those bodies to make the cartridges rather than doing this horrible orphan shuffle? He explains with, honestly, it appears a bit of regret that even if he wanted to do it like that, it just would not be possible. After he sacrificed his body, any form he inhabits is counted as dead. So far, as the Abyss is concerned, and thus, none of the Umbra Hands can be used as a Curse Absorber. There's actually a bit more to it than that, but it's sort of weird and we'll learn about that later on. Only, it turns out that this might have all been the plan, and they managed to get him monologuing, as, with an immense crash, something appears, driving an Umbra Hand clear through the fortress wall. As the dust clears, we see a strange, almost tentacled shape. And yup, Reg has arrived. Only no, not exactly. He is something entirely different now. And this right here is where the volume goes insane. Meet what's come to be known as Dark Reg. And no, as far as I know, we've never found out what exactly this transformation is, or even why it happens, as of where the manga is at the time of this recording. But everyone, Bondrude included, is pretty surprised. Reg took out three of the Umbra Hands Bondrude sent after him with apparent ease. No mean feat, considering 
that these are Black Whistle level cave raiders. Nanachi calls out a warning to Reg, but he doesn't seem to be paying anything any heed. Instead, he fires himself past her like a howitzer shell, yelling his defiance, hemorrhaging black electricity, and his remaining cabled limb whirling around him. Bondrood fires off several shaker darts, but the seemingly berserk Reg, now a thing of lightning and pain, easily deflects them as he bears down on the madman. Yes, this is another anime and manga trope that I adore. You know, the moment where the hero goes completely moggy and loses all control and is thus able to fight the big bad one-on-one. -on -one. Kick ass. Riko tells Nanachi to handle things here and rushes off to rescue Prushka while Reg engages Bondroot, who seems both genuinely impressed and excited to fight an Albard. Oh, and this is also pretty nifty. Usually, Bondrood is drawn with a sketchy style, while everyone else has more standard lines, giving him an unearthly feel. But now, after his transformation, Reg is the one who looks sketchy, while Bondrood seems solid, almost as if Reg is now something so otherworldly that he makes the arch-villain look normal by comparison. That's… yeah. While I do have certain issues with some of Tsukushi's content at times, holy crap does the man understand visual storytelling. I'm almost sad that we will never get to see what his Made in Abyss pop-up book would have looked like, but I'll bet it would have been quite something. Anyway, the two clash. Third works meeting whirling cables and black energy, but initially Bondrood seems to have the upper hand, batting Reg around as if he was weightless, and then follows it up with another relic, a shattering prismatic beam fired from his helmet, Gangway. Damn it, does that look awesome. But Reg's cable is moving so fast that he is able to deflect it and kicks off a wall, flying into counterattack. Bondrood responds with a Spragmos blast, piercing clean through him. Only, no, Reg twisted aside at the last second, and the beam drilled through his cloak as he smacks past Bondrood, ripping off a piece of his helmet with his teeth. Yes, as I said, this sequence rules. Under the torn metal, we actually get a look at what Bondrood's face looks like, including a bizarre looking relic in place of his eye. That actually reminds me a bit of the Rinnegan from Naruto. And no, according to Tsukushi, this weird relic is not how he's able to spy on Nanachi's vision, and we don't know how he does that, or what this relic does. My guess is that we never will. Oh right, as always, we get some really fun stuff in between chapters, and in this volume, these take the form of nifty little explanations of how Bondrood's suit and his various weaponized relics function. But yeah, this is the bit that I was going to mention. See, while I'm not going to talk too much about the third arc, as it's still ongoing and I honestly have no idea where the story is headed in that regard, one thing that I do enjoy about this story is, well, without too many spoilers, both of the primary villains in the completed arcs thus far namely Bondrood and Wazukian, oh don't worry, we will get to Captain Cucumber before too long, have a certain resonance with Riko, albeit in different domains. Again, we'll go more into Wazukian when we reach his part of the story, but in Bondrood's case, both him and Riko are utterly obsessed with the Abyss and getting down deeper learning the secrets of the bottom of the Great Pit. 
They're both also gigantic relic nerds. Remember Rikor attempting to essentially put relics together to make her own, which she then names. And yeah, this was actually explained a bit more in the game, and Bondrude building himself a sick-ass suit, while Rikor would likely never consider doing all the horrific stuff Bondrood has to get down lower, the implication is that, well, it's not impossible, or at least it's likely not quite that clear-cut. What would she do if, say, she found herself faced with an insurmountable obstacle to her descending any further? What would she be willing to sacrifice? It's something that I've always loved from a narrative perspective. The protagonist seeing elements of themselves in the villain. For instance, yes, anyone who's been on one of our streams will know that I am a huge Batman nerd, and seeing Scarecrow reflecting his use of psychology and fear, Two-Face representing his dual identity, and Bane reflecting his raw physicality combined with intelligence, that's just really strong storytelling and world building. Of course, in this case, it's so significant that I have joked more than once that Bondrood is going to turn out to be an alternate future version of Recall or something, because that would both be amazing and completely insane. And you know what? It's still not entirely impossible. I can't prove that I'm right, but you can't prove that I'm wrong. Anyway. Reg and Bondrood face off against each other, apparently evenly matched. This time, it's Reg who attacks first, kicking off with enough force to destroy the floor underneath him and launching himself towards the madman. Bondrood blocks him using third works, but this time, in another really great series of panels, Seriously, while the battles in Maiden Abyss are a bit thin on the ground, Tsukushi knows how to work them out, and Reg lands such a solid strike that it rips right through the tail-like relic, actually managing to catch Bondrood off guard, destroying his extra limb, and causing him to resort to another new weapon, Far Caress, a net-like black goo that binds Reg to the floor. If I'm not mistaken, Far Caress is actually a living creature, and that only raises further questions. Meanwhile, searching for Prushka, Riko stumbles onto Zoaholic, being operated by a strange four-armed Umbra Hand. We cut back to the battle. Reg cannot break free of Far Caress, but Nanachi notices him for once being both smart and decisive. Perhaps too decisive, as he's beginning to charge the incinerator, and she realizes that Reg is going to fire an absolutely cataclysmic blast, powered by his new form. She tells Rico to run like hell in the opposite direction, as she gallops over to Reg and leaps on top. Don't overthink that last sentence telling him not to go through with it, as he will almost certainly kill Rico. And... okay. What happens next is complicated, but let me see if I can't pass it out. Nanachi is too late. Everything turns white, streaked with pitch black lightning. Everything distorts as a colossal explosion. Damn it, but that looks sweet spreads out, and when she opens her eyes, she's flying through the air. Or, no, she's falling into a deep, new pit, opened into the landscape where part of the fortress was. Reg catches her and drags her to an outcrop, and from there, they survey the utter devastation 
below. Nice work, Reg. Now this, from my understanding, was not well explained in the manga or the anime. But if I'm not mistaken, according to Tsukushi, Reg can, in this case subconsciously, exclude biological targets from his attack. Which is why it didn't evaporate Nanachi or Riko. It was in a Q&A interview, if I'm not mistaken, but I cannot for the life of me find it again. Regardless, that was one hell of a battle. In the aftermath, and oh yeah, I forgot about this stuff. Reg tells Nanachi that when he entered dark mode, it felt like a bunch of other people were inside him, and one of them took control. I th I think that's supposed to be Liza, but I'm not sure who the other one is supposed to be, but yeah. This is all pretty weird. My guess is by the time we get there, this will have been explained in the manga. We do get another pretty fun moment, as Nanachi wonders what it was that she said, which snapped Reg out of it. But it turns out that somehow feeling Nanachi's, um, fluffiness not only snapped Reg out of it, but it also apparently gave him the happy pants. No, I'm not gonna show that, you weirdos. But she clouts him one. Still, looking down at the damaged fortress and the absolutely enormous pit blasted, I am assuming, into layer 6, thanks to Reg's enormous blast. They wonder what happened to Bondroot. Did he get nuked? Is this the end of the battle? As if to answer, suddenly, the large four-armed umbra hand we saw earlier smashes through the wall, speaks in Bondroot's voice, grabs Reg, and in one of my favorite panels in the manga, the pair tumble down into the pit together. After being driven off the cliff by the four-armed guardian, Umbra Hand, Reg lands somewhere far below, deep within some kind of a pit. He stands up, holding the clearly dead and broken Umbra hand like a bag of spam, and turns to take stock of his surroundings. He's on a small raised area, surrounded by a seething sea of horrible, gibbering things. And yeah, if you've been paying attention, you might know where he is at present. A familiar, sinister voice floats out of the darkness at him, and Bondrood steps forward, also seemingly none the worse for wear. As the creatures begin to clamber all over him, he reveals that he knows them all by name. Yup. These are the orphans from his earlier experiments. Remember Nanachi and Mitty's elevator fun times? Well, this is what generally happens, I guess. Creatures even more wretched and less sentient. The two go back and forth for a bit, but Bondru does allude to a possibly even darker truth here, mentioning that there is a breeding section for live specimens. And no, I am not even going to start to dissect that. You'll probably note me doing something similar when we come to what this Freudian horror show on layer 6 means. The two square off again, and Bondrood reveals that he brought Reg down here deliberately. He wants both of them to be able to fight at their maximum power without further devastating Edo Front. And sure enough, Bondrood lunges towards him, shredding through the hollows with seemingly no regard. Uh, mate, weren't you just telling Reg 
you know what, never mind. This will come up again later, but for now, remember this incident. It's one of a handful of things about Bondrood that are either inconsistencies or, quite possibly, reveal a lot about his true nature and motivations in a pretty subtle way. Reg, though, is now thoroughly incensed, launching himself at Bondrood again, cable whirring. Oh, I didn't actually spot this until this read-through, but one of Reg's eyes is still dark and has the tracer, so I guess the implication is that somehow Reg has been able to retain his power from the dark mode transformation while also somehow keeping his mind and thus his control intact. I really, really hope that this all gets explained eventually because Wow, am I confused. Regardless, just like that, the fight is on like Donkey Kong. Bondrood fires Gangway at Reg, but he's too fast, sliding under the shattering blast, bowling the madman off his feet and following this up with a powerful strike from his cable, launching Bondrood into the air. Quick, juggle him! Only, yeah. Again, this is quite subtle and clever, and it's one thing that I do like about how Made in Abyss is written. Once a rule has been laid out, Tsukushi doesn't waste his time recapping or re-explaining how the Abyss works. Sure enough, Within the large tank on Bondrood's back, strange, squelching sounds can be heard. Assumably, Reg popping him up caused the madman to become subject to the curse of Lear 6, but rather than mutating, the cartridges in his suit absorbed it and died. And speaking of, huh, kind of a lot of really smart and subtle in a foreshadowing sort of way, things happen here, so let's go through them step by step. The pair clash again and rebound in midair, both lodging themselves on opposite walls of the pit. Bondrood is surprised. Apparently, Reg is even faster now in this hybrid form than he was in dark mode. Reg reveals that, okay, someone I'm guessing either Liza or the other girl. Yes, I know, later chapters, but remember, until we get there, they basically don't exist. We will get there when we get there. Either way, it's really interesting. Bondrood, in turn, is also experiencing something as more cartridges rupture within his suit. It appears that he's sprouting talons. What? Meanwhile, while whatever is happening to Bondrood happens, Reg gets a transmission from Nanachi, revealing that she has a plan for this final round, and that he should listen up. Suddenly, with a resolute expression on his face, Reg bounds upwards, launching himself back towards Ido Front, with a surprised and annoyed Bondrood in hot pursuit. Remember, he wanted to face Reg down in the miniature garden because they just blew up a large portion of his fancy fortress. The two trade blows, as well as blasts as they rise, with Reg fighting a desperate rearguard action. Far Caress narrowly misses him, and he fires an incinerator blast in response that, while Bondrood is easily able to evade, does force him back for a second, buying Reg some room and allowing him to climb further. Ah, I think I might see what you're doing. Maybe. Yup. As we soon see, the Nachi's plan was for Reg to ascend and to force Bondrood to pursue him, resulting in the mad scientist burning through his cartridges 
assumably eventually running out, and getting mittied himself. Some poetic justice, I guess, and if Rikor was able to destroy Zoaholic, that would be the end of him. Hell, even if they just managed to kill this body, it should allow everyone to find Prushka and escape, right? However, as we see, it's not going to be quite that easy. Reg also has a ticking clock. The 10 minute limit since he fired his incinerator is almost up, meaning that he will lapse into unconsciousness soon. And in a battle of endurance, the man with infinite bodies generally wins. The fighting retreat continues. Bondrood burns through and ejects cartridge after cartridge, taunting Reg by calling them out by name, likely implying that he, at least in part, is killing them. Dude, we also see that Bondrood is starting to look different, chunkier somehow, more bulky, and sure enough, one of his boots explodes, revealing that his leg now ends in a clasped furry paw? Oh? Oh! Oh, oh shit. Regardless, as the dam begins to flood down into the canyon, the two burst out onto the surface, revealing yet another of my favorite panels in this manga, and yeah, fair warning, I think from here on out there is generally at least one this is now my favorite panel in the manga moment. It's just, oh man, is this manga gorgeous. However, we do get to see that Bondrood is indeed mutating. And as you might have twigged onto, this is really interesting and also another of my big nope, I do not understand this at all moments in the manga. So as we'll see in a bit, Bondrood explains that he's finally managed to achieve it thanks to the cartridges and the mutative effects of the Layer 6 curse. What is it, you may ask? Well, Bondrood has become a blessed hollow like the Nachi, achieving a pleasing form that is built to live in the abyss, and is also furry. Yes, I really hope this all gets explained as well. So, what is the part that I am confused about. Well, see if you spot it. How about now? See it yet? Yeah, that now furry mutated tail is not a part of Bondrood. It is a relic called Third Works, and it was also busted up by Reg pretty badly, so why did this mutate? Feel free to let me know in the comments. There's also something that you're probably missing. I know I did the first time I read this and it's, oh, you're gonna want to break out the hanky for this one, folks, but we'll get there in a bit. Regardless, Bondrood ejects his cartridges. He no longer needs them. The party's plan hasn't merely failed. By the looks of things, they've actually made Bondrood substantially stronger, and with recall elsewhere, and reg due to collapse any second, what the hell do they do now? After the madman, ejects his last four canned orphans, leaving them lying on the ground. He calls three of them out by name. However, before he can name the fourth, we hear a familiar sound as Mania rushes up to one, crying out plaintively and licking at the unmentionable fluids seeping out. Oh no, 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 no. Nanachi takes a step back in shock and utter miserable horror 
as she realizes the significance of this. The nameless fourth cartridge is none other than Prushka. There was never any hope of saving her to begin with. The entire rescue mission wasn't just pointless, it was completely doomed from the outset. Their friend is dead. Bonrood got everything he wanted, and now they are entirely at his mercy. Oh, and okay, I think I understand this, so let me attempt to explain. Bondrood wasn't just looking for a way to return from Layer 6. After observing how Nanachi became a blessed hollow, allowing her to not only move up and down at will, but also perceive extrasensory aspects of the abyss, like the force field and the emotions of those within, he wanted to obtain it for himself. We'll get into Prushka's backstory in just a bit, but I think the implication here is that Bondrood, okay, apologies for my choice of language here, but I honestly think it's not that far off, groomed Prushka to love him, then manipulated her, including the previous battle on the island, into not only willingly becoming a cartridge for him, but taking the double curse out of love, much as Mitty did for Nanachi, and this granted him his blessed form. You are one sick bastard. Now I am going to jump a little bit forward here to help this make more sense chronologically, but we see a bit later that Prushka was originally the subject of Bondrood's early experiments. I'm guessing specifically involving the effects of the curse on young people, and as what looks like a toddler or very young child, suffered something similar to failure to thrive syndrome. And yes, this was amazingly hard to read as a new dad. Damn it, Tsukushi. Do you need to talk to someone? However, rather than putting Prushka down, Bondrood instead and I'm guessing here, decided at that point to try and heal her to, I guess, hold her in reserve for something else. Or maybe he did indeed feel some responsibility towards her. I am honestly not sure which is worse, to be honest, but he did eventually have some success in bringing her out of her catatonia by giving her mania as a pet. I have to wonder if this might not be a nod towards the actual practice of using animals and pets as a therapeutic solution for abused and neglected young children, and if so, holy crap Tsukushi, what are you trying to do? Break my damn heart? Anyway, in an extended and honestly really lovely montage, we get to see Prushka grow into the girl we met. Unfortunately, there are rather a lot of boobs in this sequence, so I can't show you much. As always, you can go and check out the manga yourself if you want. But we do eventually see Bondrood introducing her to cartridges, and explains that this is a little girl that decided to help her papa, and that to achieve his own goals, he needs this help from Prushka, manipulating her into agreeing to help him. Yeah, that is evil, and it really boggles my mind how people can treat Bondrood as some sort of tortured sexy man genius when this sequence exists. Oh, and yes, you were indeed correct. We get an explanation as to what these zombies were in the previous bit. I have no idea how I missed this, to be honest. As you said, they are failed Umbra hands, likely suffering irreparable brain damage from whatever process Zoaholic requires. I don't know. Regardless, the paper mache whistle is a gift from the irrepressible Prushka in an attempt to ease their suffering somewhat. We also see that Bondrood did use Prushka 
as something of an unsuspecting Judas goat to put the party at ease, which is what allowed him to abscond with Nanachi and Reg, and to conclude the sequence, we first get to see another frigging heartbreaking sequence, showing her friendship with Rico developing from her side of things, as well as the results of Bondrude's manipulation, seeing him apparently die, and going into hysterics as the catalyst for her willingly becoming a cartridge, with the final part of this sequence being, nope, there's no way in hell that I am posting some of these panels on YouTube even censored. These two should be more than enough to explain why, but basically we get to see, from her perspective, Prushka being dismembered and vivisected. Remember when battlefield surgery was the darkest thing in this manga? Yeah, I miss those days, and I wish I could tell you that it gets better from here. Back in the present, Reg is about to bubble, but Nanachi calms him down. However, those are not tears of sadness. Reg is now incandescently furious at Bondrut, chiding him for using his loving adopted daughter, who only wanted the best for him and even had good things to say about him for such a cruel and selfish purpose. Bondrude, in turn, is utterly unrepentant. By the way, Furororo might as well be subtitled as Evil Laugh, but he does reveal that he can now indeed read Reg's emotions, and also that this was part of his goal in preparation for the Dawn, likely Bondrude's namesake, something that occurs every 2,000 years. And yes, this is an aspect of the story that has been gone over and dissected pretty thoroughly in the fan theories section on the Discord, as well as by Pootie Spaghetti over on their channel. Reg, however, is not standing for any of this crap and lunges in to attack. We also see that, oh damn it man, Rico overheard the entire thing and is leaning against a wall nearby, tears falling in sorrow and despair. But what is she doing here? Well, we'll learn why in just a bit. Reg and Bondrude continue to battle with, oh holy crap, she's still alive, that is horrible. Prushka realizing that somehow, and I don't understand whether this is literal or figurative, but in her words, the madman is drawing power from her suffering. Reg is beginning to succumb to the effects of using his incinerator. They are very nearly out of time. Reg doesn't observe Bondrude powering up both of his Sparagmos projectors, and then, when he desperately fires his incinerator, these are used in an ingenious fashion. Rather than dodging, Bondrude instead literally breaks the blast with his stacked and layered beams, and is finally able to land a decisive strike on Reg with his now somehow mutated third works, and ends the fight by impaling Reg through his navel with one of his new claws. Gloating, Bondrude reveals that he plans to cut Reg in half as his next experiment, but Reg reveals that he's realized something about himself. He somehow designed to experience simulations of human sensations, ranging from ahem arousal to pain, but these are, at the end of the day, merely simulations, and while a normal human would be paralyzed by pain now, he is able to overcome it and reveals a trump card. His dog print-like feet can also fire the incinerator. However, the now hyper-agile Bondrude 
simply leaps over the blast and drives Reg's head into the ground. Oh dear. Suddenly, an incinerator blast seems to come out of literally nowhere, cutting straight through Bondroot. What the hell? And then we see Rico carrying Reg's arm, firing the beam. It appears that somehow Reg can control his limb even when it's detached. Was this the true plan all along? If so, definitely one of those this is just crazy enough to work things, I guess. As he dies, we see Bondrood recalling Prushka's last wish to him, that he give up his pursuit of the party and let them go in peace, as they were, at the end of the day, her first true friends. And after this, we see that Prushka is now truly dead. With Bondrood bifurcated, much in the same manner he promised to do to Reg, the party has somehow emerged victorious in theory, but in practice, they are all in pretty rough shape. Reg is badly injured and drifting into unconsciousness, and they were not able to save Prushka. Rikor is absolutely devastated by her failure. With her tormentor finally down and Mitty avenged, Nanachi tells Bondru that even though there are too many Umbra hands for them to fully wipe him out, they could now, if they so willed, destroy his facilities as well as Zoaholic to permanently bring his threat to a close, or at least guarantee that he never achieves what he hoped to. Astonishingly, he responds by congratulating her on their victory and wishing them all the best on their journey to the bottom. Nanachi, despite her hatred and long quest for revenge, finds that she's both surprisingly and genuinely touched by this gesture. And with that, the battle is finished. But where to from here? Without a white whistle, the party cannot use the relic to cross the boundary between layers 5 and head down into the deep abyss of layer 6. Barring any sudden and emotionally devastating twists, their journey ends here. Back with the party, Reg is recovering. Nanachi's done her best to bandage him up, but he's still in rough shape. Riko, however, is nearly inconsolable at the loss of her friend Prushka. Yeah, it's almost like a young child is going to be heavily traumatized by the tsunami of death, pain, and horror that this ridiculously bad idea of a quest has been somewhat understandable. At present, we see that Riko is still cradling Prushka's dead cartridge. Damn it, Tsukushi, ease up on us for a second, mate. And sobbing, she tries turning it, and to her horror, all of the awful stuff inside that was once her friend just pours out. Ugh. Only there's something else there, something that gives Riko the same feeling Prushka once did. And yup, if that shape looks familiar to you, and yes, this is where I came down with a serious case of allergies this time, it's a white whistle. One that looks oddly like a heart. And as Riko cleans the blood and bile off it, it plays a mournful tone and seems to glow. Yup, remember what we know about White Whistles. It must be given willingly, and this was Prushka's final gift to the party. Should Bondrood keep his word and honor her last wish, or should they prevail against him, they would have a way to continue with their adventures. This was actually very cleverly foreshadowed 
If you remember Bondrude explaining whistles to Rico earlier, and saying that if you can't make it below yourself, you could possibly do so as a white whistle. Now, this next bit is odd, because if I remember correctly, Tsukushi clarified in an interview what happened during the missing time here, but apparently the party honoring Prushka's wish did not attempt to destroy Zoaholic, instead allowing Bondrude to take a new body. He, in turn, allowed them to stay and rest at Edo Front, assumedly unmolested, until they were ready to head below. Which is why Riko is eating the energy rations. It's also why Nanachi says later that she'll honor Riko's instructions, likely referring to this armistice with Bondrut. Okay, okay. And yes, this confused the pants off me during my first time through. As they leave to head below, they turn to see the defeated White Whistle, who has come out to see them off himself, flanked by several wicked-looking Umbrahands. His mask still retains the damage Reg inflicted, maybe to honor them, maybe because, with Prushka dead, there's no real reason to repair it. And that brings me to the character of Bondrude, and, you know, he's such a conundrum to me that I cannot help but find him fascinating. This isn't your standard evil bastard anime villain, or a sympathetic sad backstory, oh I just want to make a perfect world anime villain, or even a force of nature anime villain. Bondrude is sort of all three at once. He's really, really evil sometimes out of seeming curiosity more than anything else. He might care about his charges, and he does seem relatively post-human in that he essentially doesn't even have a body. I know Pooty is working on a big Bondrood blowout video, but let's see if I can maybe throw my two cents into the ring. If I had to make sense of Bondrood, I've got four theories, most of which could be true simultaneously. So, before we see the party off, let's go through them. And as always, feel free to let me know what you think in the comments. Theory number one. Bondrude was a good person once, but his mind has become warped. Not only by being down in the abyss for so long, but by constant and sustained use of Zoaholic which was actually mentioned to be potentially harmful to the user's mind. And I think this theory is partially confirmed by Tsukushi's notes at the end of chapter 36. So this would mean that he's now pretty much a sociopath. And as sociopathy can be caused by a variety of neurological issues as well as psychological, well, who knows what happens when you don't have one constant body to mediate your emotions and neurochemistry. Theory number two. Bondrude is a Randian objectivist. Objectivism is, in this context, probably best oversimplified as all morality is subjective and thus the ends justify the means. It's also a big part of Bioshock and you know, the other day someone told me that Bioshock was considered a really old dad game now and bloody hell that cut deep. I can only imagine what you young whippersnappers think of classics like One Must Fall 2097. Ugh. Oh right, so this would mean that Bondrude knows what he's doing is wrong, but believes that what he's doing also means that, at the end of the day, it'll be worth it. And of course, this ties right into number three. Bondrude knows something we don't, and is desperately trying to prepare for an incoming disaster. Cycles, cycles, wibbly woo. Yeah, I still don't understand what's cutting there, but every 2000 years in the Made in Abyss universe, a big thing happens. 
that's implied to be both cataclysmic and massively important. And Bondrood seems to be, well, doing a thing to get something done before it happens. I am guessing that we'll learn more about this as the manga progresses through its final arc, especially now that, by the looks of it, we're heading into Layer 7 proper. The fourth one is quite simply this. Bondrood is evil. Pure evil. And also an amazing manipulator, able to cultivate love in others towards him with both carefully considered actions and his dark charisma. He will do this so long as it suits his needs, but he is actually incapable of feeling true love for anyone. However, he's managed to convince himself that he's in the right, that he truly does love them, and this is all for the greater good. Self-manipulation, essentially. Probably the strongest evidence I can see of this is Bondrood staging the battle with the party and his death to maneuver Prushka into agreeing to becoming a cartridge and him devastating the low hollows of the miniature garden in his battle with Reg with seemingly no regard. Oh yes, and also evil laugh. But then, he genuinely did seem to care for Nanachi and was actually pleased after the party defeated him, wishing them all the best on their journey below. However, honestly, Tsukushi isn't really big on explaining things outside of interviews, so it could easily be that we will never know, and this body-hopping mad scientist will forever remain an enigma. At least until someone asks Tsukushi in an interview. Haha. Ha. Regardless, after a time, the party finds their way down to the relic chamber, and, dwarfed by the enormous pool of swirling water and the large portal ahead of them, they say their farewells and prepare to take their last dive. Who knows what awaits them below, down there, in the darkness of Layer 6. And thus ends Volume 5 of Maiden Abyss, as well as the final video in the first series. Next month? Well, we'll start on Layer 6. And trust me, if you thought Layer 5 was unnecessarily dark, well, you're right, but Layer 6 is just so much worse, in almost every way you can imagine. Although you will finally get to meet this character, and that makes it almost worth it. Wait, what was I talking about? Oh right, before we finish for the day, I just want to say a massive thanks, as always, to my wonderful patrons, Jake Reagan, Piece of Yeast, El Espresso, Cheerful Satanist, Starwin Marwin, Question Man 6, Kel Kor, Jacob Ramsey, Crazy, Opinion Custard, James Bakes Bread, Wargle, Inukir Koji, Rose Montgomery, Lance Goebel, Paul Norberger, Rafferty, Erin Arnold, The Hedgehog Gamer, Simone, XTC Pill, B Empress, Jake, Ranger Danger, and Cheshire Quill. If you want to see more like this, why not stick around? Subscribe, bell, you know the drill. If you want to hear me say your name, get early access to most of my videos, have some fun perks on the Discord, and, you know, help Mrs. Owl and I out or buy Baby Owl a present, and ensure that I can keep on doing what I do into 2024, why not take a look at our Patreon? If you want to chit-chat about, well, basically anything, drop by our Twitch. We generally stream on Sundays, and next month we'll be going back to Fridays too. Take care, my friends, and cheers. This is The Owl, signing off.